Uh, good evening. This is a continuation of the May 9th Board of Education meeting. The board has been in closed session since six o'clock for collective negotiation matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. And two, the employ appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body. Could we rise for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're going to start the meeting with student and staff recognition. Our first recognition is FCCLA. Yeah, and Wendy Albert. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank the school board and Dr. Moyer for honoring our students this evening. My name is Wendy Albert. I'm the division chair for career and technical education. Uh, career and technical student organizations such as DECA, Family Career and Community Leaders of America, and Skills USA are important organizations that help our students extend their learning beyond the classroom. There are so many exciting opportunities for them, including fostering leadership experiences, um, opportunities for business partnerships, uh, and as well as the opportunity for students to demonstrate what they've been learning in their career and technical education classes. Uh, the students this evening will be recognized for their accomplishments at uh, state and national level competitions, and we're so excited that they are um, going to be recognized this evening. Um, first up, we would like the FCCLA students to come forward. Students, if you could come forward, um, you're going to face the camera, so kind of line up in the front here, um, and teachers as well, if you guys would come forward as as well. Okay, hi, I'm Sarah Merrick. I am one of the advisors for FCCLA. Uh, Family and Cons Career Community Leaders of America is comprised of over 200,000 students enrolled in FCS classes across the country. Students in FCCLA can compete in many different competitions specific to their career focus or area of interest. Students extend their learning beyond the classroom by competing in competitions that align with FCS career pathways offered at York, including culinary arts and hospitality management, early childhood and education, fashion design, and interior design. This year we had 25 state competitors who brought home nine gold medals, 15 silver, and one bronze. We are so proud of our students and students' accomplishments this year throughout FCCLA competitions. Congratulations. All right, so I am, uh, have the pleasure of congratulating all of you in reading the proclamation. Whereas FCCLA is a nonprofit national career and technical education student organization for young men and women enrolled in family and consumer sciences in public and private schools through grade 12. And whereas the Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America, FCCLA, State Competition Award Program is acknowledged throughout the nation as a prestigious student recognition program in family and consumer sciences related education. And whereas the FCCLA State Leadership Conference was held in Springfield, Illinois on April 6th and 7th this year, 2017. And the following York Community High School students earn top positions in the competition categories as noted. First off, I'm going to say I apologize ahead of time if I don't get your names pronounced correctly. Um, so my apologies there. But in apparel construction, the first category, semi-formal and formal, silver, Jade, Jeffrey, Jade. 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 Okay, <laughs> if you can help me. <laughs> Um, I don't want to slaughter it that much, so I, I apologize, Jade. Jolene Gundrum and Christine Millens. Casual wear, 
Gabriella Purpura, Children's Literature Teams Gold, Olivia Becker, and Jamie Killian, as well as Jenna Galac Galac Galicchio <laughs> and Elena Vesmar. Culinary Arts Star Event, Silver, Kevin Homan, and Samantha Flesh. Bronze, Allison Stromel. Environmental Ambassador, Star Event Silver, Jillian, Juliana Gacy. Juliana Gacy. Fashion Construction, Star Event Silver, Madison Miller. Food Production, Salad Silver, Isabel Lopiano. Interior Design, Senior Star Event Silver, Ella B. Rode. Uh, interior Design, Occupational Star Event Silver, Ikra. Ikra. Okay. Um, pastry Arts, Cookie, Gold, Nina Fabrizias, Silver, uh, Alexandra Geary, Preschool Lesson, Silver, Clarissa Getze, uh, Preschool Lesson Team, Olivia Becker and Jamie Killian, Professional Career Image Gold, uh, Ayana. Ayana Johnson, and Lauren Noonan, Silver, Allison Evans and Catherine Starbridge. And whereas, in addition uh, to Kevin Homan placing second in the Culinary Arts Star event, he received a $1,500 yearly renewable scholarship from the Culinary Institute of America and a $500 scholarship to Johnson and Wales University. Yes, thank you. Very nicely done. Enjoy the East Coast. <laughs> and whereas Madison Miller, Fashion Construction Star Event, and Ikra Shak, Interior Design Occupational Star Event, both qualified to compete in nationals, taking place in July in Nashville, Tennessee, with Madison receiving a $750 scholarship to Johnson & Wales University and a $1,500 scholarship to the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. Congratulations for that, too. Mm. And whereas these accomplishments bring pride and prestige to your community high school, to District 205, and to the community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of the Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205 express congratulations to you, these students, their parents, and the faculty of the Family and Consumer Sciences Department, Wendy Albert, Division Chair for Career and Technical Education, Lori Foss, Lindsay Goldsmith, Sarah uh, Merrick, Rachel Martin, and Ashley McDonough for these outstanding accomplishments and achievements. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Our next recognition is for Illinois Distributive Education Clubs of America, DECA, Jim Burrell. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to recognize these three 
uh, amazing young men. Uh, Distributive Education Clubs of America is a marketing business uh, organization and the kids compete uh, in role plays, uh, economics tests, and cluster tests. And there's different um, events they can compete in, but the most difficult one I think everyone in DECA agrees is financial analysis, where they look at uh, you know, financial documents, income statement, uh, balance sheet for businesses, and they're giving a problem and they solve that. And there's a local competition, there's a state competition, and there's a national competition. And this year the national competition was in Anaheim, California. And trust me, every kid in the state of Illinois wants to get to Anaheim, California. Uh, so it's super difficult to get there. Um, top four out of about 30 teams, so 60 kids total, uh, at the state competition uh, advanced to nationals. And uh, so this year, and I don't want to take too much away from the proclamation, but uh, this year uh, Kevin Lipkin and Burke Corcoran finished first in the state uh, over pretty, well, every high school. Uh, all, the, all the schools participate. They're first in the state in what's arguably the most difficult competition in DECA, and that's financial analysis. Uh, Jason Kendra and Matt Anderson finished fourth in the state. So the next stop is Anaheim, and there is about 140 teams there, uh, 280 kids from every state in the union, plus uh, quite a few countries that are outside the United States. They took uh, economics uh, slash uh, financial analysis tests. And um, we had, so the top 10 are recognized for that. And Kevin Lipkin and Matt Anderson, of those 280 kids, the top kids pretty much in the country, they were recognized as top 10 on that exam. Um, as teams then, you compete. Uh, and so there's, there was a field, each, each judge had basically 10 teams attached. And you had to place top two uh, with that judge, and, and neither team did that, but uh, our kids are, you know, it's, it's just an honor for you know, us teachers um, to teach the quality, and, and I spent a week with these kids in Anaheim, and uh, they're just great kids. Uh, pretty much every kid in this room is a great kid. I know quite a few of them, and uh, we're just very, very honored to have an opportunity to recognize them. Uh, I will say one last thing is, uh, we're also participating along with uh, Ms. Carl. Ms. Carl runs the Eco Club. Uh, every year uh, we get 10 teams representing uh, a member of Congress, and it's called the Capitol Hill Challenge. And last year uh, we represented Senator Mark Kirk, and of the 5,000 teams in this stock market game, uh, we finished ninth in the country. Uh, last year we basically made an oil bet. Oil in February last year was at 27. Uh, I went to about 45 and we made quite a bit of money with oil. This year, these same three guys, along with Ms. Carl and the Econ Club, uh, have made a uh, bet on the VIX. So they shorted the VIX. Uh, and to be honest, I know Burke and I, he's in my personal finance. I'm like, are you sure you want to do that? Because I thought we were headed for a market correction. But just the opposite happened and they, they shorted the VIX. And now we're fourth in the country. Uh, and again, we're this year representing uh, Raja Krishnamurthy, he's a representative from Elmhurst, and uh, that'll be a trip. So these kids are strong kids in DECA. It, they're strong kids across the, the curriculum, and, and so is every kid in this room. So again, thank you for recognizing our kids, uh, and I guess it's proclamation time. All right, good evening. Whereas the purpose of the Illinois Distributive Education Clubs of America, DECA, is to enhance the co-curricular education of students with interest in marketing, management, and entrepreneurship, allowing students to develop skills and competence for marketing careers, build self-esteem, experience leadership, and practice community service, and is committed to the defense of marketing education and the growth of business and education partnerships. And whereas at the regional DECA conference held in Rosemont this winter, over 900 participating students competed in economic exams, career cluster exams, and role plays, being ranked against all other competitors in their event and with the top 10 students advancing to state competition. And whereas with over 1,000 students participating, 12 York Community High School DECA students competed in the state 
DACA conference at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare in March, where four students qualified for the national conference by placing in the top four in their event. And whereas Matt Anderson and Jason Kentra competed in the financial services team decision-making event, finishing fourth in the state, and Burke Corcoran and Kevin Lipkin competed in the financial service team decision-making event. Finishing first in the state and advancing to the DECA International Career Development Conference held April 27th to 30th in Anaheim, California. And whereas, each of these teams completed a 100-point role play and 100-question economics and financial analysis exam, which was judged against 140 other teams from all 50 states and other countries from around the world with Kevin Lipkin, and Matt Anderson finishing in the top 10 out of 280 students who competed in the economics exam of the financial services team decision-making event. And whereas, these accomplishments bring great pride and prestige to your community high school, to District 205, and to the community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205 express congratulations to these students, their parents, and their teacher, Jim Burrell, who serves as the York Business Department Chair for these outstanding achievements. Well done, guys. Uh, next recognition is Illinois Economic Challenge winners. Tamara Carl. The Economics Challenge is a prestigious competition where only students that have taken an AP, IB, or Honors Economics course are eligible to participate in the competition. These students represent some of the highest achieving students in the country. These students scored in the top 10 teams in all of Illinois to compete in the state finals. The competition forces students to demonstrate a deep level of knowledge and understanding of college level micro and macro economics. The intensity of the competition is difficult to replicate in this setting. But it is so exciting to see the intensity of these young professionals as they worked collaboratively, co collaboratively to problem solve. The final round of the competition is a buzzer round between the two finalists in front of a panel of prestigious judges. It is truly a nerve wracking and nail biting experience. York's second place team in the state competition is consisting of John Fetcher, Jason Kentra, Frank Luce, and Flanagan Walder. They handled this with professionalism, ease, and focus. This is the second year in the row that this team competed in the Illinois State Finals for the Economics Challenge. They're a special group of students. Their accomplishments is amazing due to the fact that they took AP Micro and AP Macro last year. They said at the end of last year that they would come back again next year to compete again, and they did. This is the first time in the Illinois economics competition history to have a team compete in the Quiz Bowl round two times in a row. This is a true testament to their depth of knowledge and understanding of the material. They worked together as a team, and they encouraged each other when a mistake was made. They were quick to the buzzer and eloquent in their answers. The buzzer round went into a heart-pounding 
double overtime. After the competition, we were in the bus and I heard the team members thanking each other for a great experience in the Illinois economics competition and commenting that, this was a that it was a pleasure to work with each other. This is a prime example of the character of these gentlemen standing up here today. In addition to placing second, York's team of Tim Bear, David Cook, Kevin Rechwalski, and Katerina Siavolis placed fourth in the state competition. Congratulations to all of you. I'm truly proud of the hard work that you have done. Good to see you. Congratulations. Uh, I'll tell you, my, my heart's still pounding about shorten the VIX. You're, <laughs> you're one tweet away from Armageddon. Um, I, I, you couldn't have a more enthusiastic supporter of ec economic education than I am. It makes our students better consumers, smarter voters, and more informed citizens. Um, and it's an interesting pattern that uh, Tamara seems to be a frequent visitor to the board meetings with her winning teams. And I'll get to that after I read the proclamation. Um, whereas the Illinois Ac Economics Challenge is an annual competition for teams of high school students in which their knowledge of economics is tested, this year involving 165 teams from 20 different schools which competed in the first online round earlier this spring, and whereas on April 7, 2017, in DeKalb, Illinois, 10 teams of four students advanced to the 2017 Illinois Economic Challenge State Finals, the championship event consisting of individual and team written tests, a critical thinking activity that required addressing an economic scenario, and advising a finance sector volunteer judge on how to address the problems and whereas the team of John Fletcher, Jason Kentra, Frank Luce, and Flanagan Walder represented York High School in the state finals, competing against finalists from Stevenson, Hinsdale South, Edwardsville, Nequa Valley High Schools, and St. Ignatius College Prep, and even a second team from York. And whereas the final quiz bowl round of competition went into double overtime against Stevenson High School, concluding with York Community High School advancing ahead of eight competing student teams to earn second place in the competition. And whereas these accomplishments bring pride and prestige to York Community High School, to District 205, and to our community, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community U Unit School District 205 express congratulations to these students, their parents, and the team coach, Tamara Carl. Advanced Placement Micro, Advanced Placement Macroeconomics, and American Government Teacher for these outstanding accomplishments. Yeah, and I just wanted to follow up on my comment about uh, Tamara being a uh, frequent visitor up here. Um, I, I think she sends teams every year to this competition, which is a great experience in itself, but it seems like every year she brings home winners. That says to me that Tamara is a highly effective teacher, and we're grateful for your efforts. Thank you.
Okay, we have PTA Reflections Regional winner. Uh, the PTA Reflections <coughs> Chair is Michelle Worley. Sorry. This past fall, we welcomed students of all grades and abilities to explore their inner artist and capture their interpretation of this year's Reflections program theme, What Is Your Story? Elmhurst schools hit 103 submissions overall. Each school held individual judging and advanced their top five entries from each category. Entries that advanced to the Elmhurst Council level were judged based on creativity, technical skills, and interpretation of the theme. We had 94 entries advanced to the council level, of which 42 advanced to DuPage East regional level. Another level of judging occurred, and 15 of our Elmhurst students' entries were selected to compete at the state level. Of that, one went on to national. Novena Thacker's Reflections Project was featured among the top young artists in the country during the national competition. Novena's literary piece, How I Got My Favorite Color, captured deep reflection and imagination as she described her process of selecting her favorite color. Congratulations, Novena. We have you stand over here. All right, you just stand right there, okay? And I'm gonna say things that tell about how really proud of you we are, and we are. The proclamation. Whereas the Illinois PTA, a statewide volunteer organization dedicated solely to the welfare of children and youth in the home, school, and community, was founded on May 30, 1900, and has since worked diligently to support public schools and to ensure that all children and youth have equal opportunities and access to quality education. And whereas the arts, the National PTA Reflections Program, support student success and serve as a valuable tool for building strong partnerships in the school community, and whereas Reflections is the National PTA Arts Program that asks children to create works of art in any of six different arts categories, dance choreography, film production, literature, music composition, photography, and visual arts, reflecting upon a different theme each year. The theme for 2016-2017 school year being, what is your story? And you told it, didn't you? And whereas the starting with the local PTA student projects advanced through a judging system, beginning with local council and moving on to district, region, state, and national levels of the program, and whereas the national PTA reflections submissions are reviewed by experts in the visual, literary, and performing arts, where judges look for personal interpretation on the program theme that best exemplify creativity and technical skill. And whereas Jefferson Elementary School second grade student Novena Thacker was chosen to advance to the national competition in literature with her entry, How I Got My Favorite Color, where her project was featured among the top young artists in the country during the National PTA Reflections Competition, which took place in May 2017. And whereas these accomplishments bring pride and prestige to Jefferson Elementary School, District 205, Novena Thacker, her family, and her community, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205 express congratulations to the student for uh, her outstanding academic accomplishment. <laughs> and I'm very sure she wrote something much better than this. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah. Skills USA, Ken. One thing I know is Ken Ross can't top that. <laughs> Yeah, you're probably right. She's got way more guts than I ever had. Um, I have trouble doing this now. Um, good evening. Um, it's always a gamble when I come up to speak every year. Um, you notice I have a lot of things written down. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, my coworkers, Joe Stoles, uh, Ron Roback, and Dan Kellenberg couldn't make it tonight, um, and Ken Ross, lead advisor at York. I first want to start out by thanking the school board, uh, Dr. Morgan and his staff, uh, Principal DeLuga and her staff at York for s representing and supporting our efforts in CTE to give us the opportunity to give our students the content, knowledge, hands-on experiences that allow them to work the entire school year and then compete at the state level. Um, I don't want to take away from the proclamation, so I thought about this quite a bit today. And I wanted to give you some reflections on what I learned from our trip this year. Um, we had 34 students qualify for state. That means in February they took a written test against every other student in the state of Illinois for coveted spots in each competition. That's a record for York High School. Um, we brought 33 students down state to compete. The second interesting thing I found out, if anybody has 33 children, um, when you go to Golden Corral for dinner, there's a sticker shock when you have to pay for the meal. <laughs> and then only to find out most of them ate ice cream. So, um, but we made up for it, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and the other thing was, bringing 33 students downstate, I was intimidated by this. Um, going, wow, how are we going to deal with 33 students? And to my surprise, that this was the best trip in my 20 plus years of bringing kids down to Springfield. They were fantastic. They looked out for each other. They were on time. They were professional. And we go back to the same hotel every year, and the people that run the hotel just love when we come down because they just think our kids are the best. And so that was awesome. The other interesting thing is that we brought down 33 students to compete in nine competitions. We medaled in five of them. We had three first place winners, a second place, and a third place. Um, that's not too bad for nine competitions, and we placed in five of them. A uh, little note on a couple of our students, because I don't want, like again, I want each one to be recognized by the proclamation. Uh, Mike Falco is a repeat gold winner in collision repair. He went to nationals last year and placed sixth in the nation. He's repeating and going back down this year to amp it up and do better than he did last year. And now that he's a senior about to graduate, he's got a great career path in front of him. The other notable thing is Joey Gemini. Go like this, Joe, so you know who you are. Okay. <laughs> Joe's a freshman, took first in state. He's going to nationals as a freshman. Um, that's pretty daunting. <laughs> Any other neat things I was going to say? No. OK. So anyways, I want to thank everybody, congratulate our students. Uh, one of them couldn't make it tonight. He had a volleyball game. But uh, it's really a pleasure this time of year to come in front of you guys and, and really uh, acknowledge the work that our students put in and so thank you very much you're coming back again <laughs> we'll see you i like it good yeah. good okay so i'll read the proclamation whereas the skills usa state competition is acknowledged as a prestigious student recognition program in industrial arts education which provides quality educational experiences for students in leadership, teamwork, citizenship, and character development, in addition to promoting community service. And whereas this program encourages excellence on the part of individual students and encourages schools to establish industry standards for job skill training in the classroom. 
And whereas the following York Community High School students earn medals in the specified competition categories at the Skills USA Illinois Championships on April 28, 2017 in Springfield, Illinois, as noted, Michael Falco, first place, collision repair technology. Joseph Gimini, first place, technical drafting CAD. Jeremy Olson, first place, auto service technology. Matthew Shepard, second place, screen printing technology. And Dylan Kelchick, third place, principles of engineering. And whereas these accomplishments bring pride and prestige to York Community High School, to District 205, and to the community, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and Administration of Elmhurst Community Unit School District 205 express congratulations to these students, their parents, and the faculty of the Industrial Technology Department, Wendy Albert, Division Chair for Technology and Applied Arts, Ken Ross, Department Leader, Dan Kallenberg, Rob Roback, and Joe Stoles for these outstanding accomplishments. Thank you. And we have we have one more recognition. This is the best part of our meetings, so I'm glad we're doing this. Shining star recipients. Linda Farenbacher, Jackie Souter. The first one um, goes to Lyndon Fehrenbacher, Principal, Sandburg Middle School. <laughs> Read right to left. <laughs> um, she was nominated by Kim Lambert Hock, Christy Gumbach, and Lisa Karens. And it says that Linda has transformed Sandburg Middle School by the power of her positivity. She has united her staff into a student-centered culture, inspiring them to seek solutions to changes collaboratively. Through the power of growth mindset, Linda has inspired students, staff, parents, and community stakeholders to challenge assumptions and work toward achieving a personal best. Linda never asks of staff and students what she is unwilling to do herself. She leads by example, steps in to lend a hand, and partners with the Sandberg community for the betterment of all. In addition, Linda teaches professional development classes, has sponsored the spelling and geography bees, has initiated comfort dogs for students with <laughs> socio-emotional needs, and supports the development of activities such as the Cardboard Challenge, Superhero Club, and Crochet Club. Congratulations, Linda. Um, for Jackie Souter, instructional coach at Bryan Middle School, nominated by Heather Bolas and Daniel Danielchik, or I'm sorry, Diane Danielchik. And it says here, Jackie works with math teachers at both the department level and during grade level PLCs in order to provide professional development on math practices. She has assisted English language arts PLCs, that's professional learning communities, um, we like acronyms in education, PLCs, in structuring PLC time so that it has become more student-centered. Her help with clarifying data 
has also been invaluable in facilitating student growth. Jackie opens up her calendar to provide professional development opportunities to teachers, as well as help with mastering new instructional strategies. In addition, because of her expansive knowledge, Jackie has given professional presentations outside of our district and has been sought out by other schools within our district to provide guidance. Congratulations, Jackie. Just, just an aside, the wonderful thing about this is these awards are nominated by the people they work with, the people who see them on a daily basis, who know when the rubber hits the road and sees what they do for our kids. And so these awards are, have a special meaning because of that. Well, we can take a quick 30 second break for anyone that needs to go home. Thank you all for coming for the recognitions. Okay, we'll move on to public comments. Uh, the board will receive public comments for up to three minutes concerning items on the agenda, as well as communications, petitions, reports from citizens or representatives. And the board doesn't respond during public comment. We, we follow up at a later time, either through the administration or from the board. So there won't be dialogue, but we, we have this time for, um, for comments from the public. So first name is Christy Weslow. Good evening. My name is Christy Weslow. I am the parent of three children that are currently enrolled at Jackson School in grades fourth, second, and first. The teachers, staff, and administration have provided an excellent learning environment for my children. Our experience has been positive, and we truly appreciate the support and instruction we have received. Tonight, I am here to speak about my concern with class sizes for third grade at Jackson School next year. Not only am I here as a concerned parent, but I am here as a concerned educator as well. I am an educator with a Master's of Education in Curriculum and Instruction. I know that larger class sizes will limit the differentiation of instruction and overall student success. The expectations for third graders increase significantly and a smaller class size is just as necessary and important as it has been in kindergarten, first, and second grades. 84 students are currently planning on entering third grade at Jackson. If the school district does not add a fourth section of third grade, there are going to be 28 students in each class. This will be a significant increase from the average of 21 students currently in second grade at Jackson. Historically, Jackson School has had three sections of first grade until this current class added a fourth. We have also had three sections of second grade prior to this year. With that said, the current class of second graders is larger than any other in the past six years at Jackson School. Additional resources within the classroom, as well as additional support for teachers, will help 
but it will not replace the level of attention and support that students receive in a room with a smaller class size. I know that the Jackson School community wants what's best for our children. That is why we raise our kids in this community. We also want to ensure that they receive the very best education and classroom environment. I will close with a request to Dr. Moyer and the District 205 school board members. Consider adding a fourth section of third grade at Jackson School. Keep the class sizes near the district and state averages, but most importantly, provide a quality learning environment for our children. Thank you. Okay, next, Andrea Gamble. Good evening. As a former second grade teacher, as well as an involved parent, I feel very strongly about taking this opportunity to fight for our kids to have the type of education and class size that drew us to Elmhurst in the first place. We moved from the city of Chicago to Jackson School so that our children would have smaller class sizes as well as wonderful teachers. Although this dream has come true thus far, I fear for what will happen the next few years when my daughter is one of 28 students in an overcrowded classroom. This number is well above the state and district averages. Last year, on September 13, 2016, Dr. Moyer and Mr. Blum both stated that the average overall elementary class size was 21.5 and that there were no classes with more than 26 students at the elementary level. You have the opportunity to proudly proclaim that again this year if you choose to make a fourth section of third grade at Jackson School. We are not asking for small class size, but rather reasonable class sizes. Our vivacious and spirited children will have a great deal of difficulty focusing, learning, and achieving their best individual success with 28 students in the class. The decision to have three classes of third grade at Jackson will result in limited differentiated instruction for a large group of students with varied academic, physical, and social emotional needs. We can't forget how, ex how exhausted and frustrated our teachers will be it will be near impossible for them to have engaged discussions with the entire class. Third grade is a critical year and a lot is asked of these students. I'm concerned for this group of students that the large classes will continue through fourth and fifth grade and potentially on to Bryan. We just want to work with the district to ensure the success of each and every one of our students. Thank you. John Sata. Good evening. Professionally, I'm not an educator, but I'm a dad. Uh, my name is John Sata. My wife, Sarah, and I are here representing our family, uh, which includes our son, Justin, currently enrolled at Jackson our, in second grade, our daughter, Sonia, in kindergarten at Jackson, and our son, Jeremy, who will uh, soon be in Jackson in a few years. Our concern is over the discussed issue of expanding classrooms at Jackson to what we understand may see some classroom sizes of 28 or 29 students per classroom in certain instances. This is very concerning to us. Uh, our oldest son, Justin, has an IEP and is currently working hard to keep pace in second grade. In many instances, he's behind. Uh, we've been and continue to work with the team at Jackson to provide Justin a positive and productive learning environment. We have extra work and reading sent home for Justin regularly to help him keep pace in second grade. We have a regular tutor that conducts sessions with Justin in the home uh, to help him with reading in his own time. We're taking extra steps to afford our son the best path to success through education. Here's the thing, 
Justin is working very hard. His team of teachers, uh, family, and his support system are also working very hard to help close the gap to get him on pace with his second grade peers. We're keeping him afloat, but barely. We're continuously worried about his educational trajectory and if he's going to be able to maintain a similar level of education, educational fluency as his classmates in the future. These concerns exist today with the classroom sizes the way they are at Jackson. As Justin heads into third grade next year, this may be one of the most critical learning years in his educational career. The idea of adding nearly 33% increase to classroom sizes is terrifying to what it may mean to students. Not just kids with IEPs or kids who are behind, but the student body as a whole. We understand that running this district isn't easy. We understand it's, uh, in essence, a business. We also want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the stakeholders um, and who they really are. We understand that that discussion includes teachers, it includes parents and administrators, but more important than all of them are the students. The number one stakeholder here is the kids. Our plea for you is to look at this with other, or our plea for you is to look for other solutions to solve the growing number in the student body. It's not easy, but simply combining classrooms to solve a number equation on paper seems like an easy way out. There, may, there must be other solutions to explore that accommodate our students to prepare them for their futures with classroom sizes that are more manageable for students and teachers. As it is, our teachers seem a little bit overwhelmed at times. Our IEP meetings sometimes run out of time. The school day goes very quickly, and there will be a lot missed by adding a load of 33% to classrooms. The desired outcome here should not be a quick fix. It should be unequivocally what is in the best interest of our students. We should be sorting the rest of this out once that item is accounted for. An increase in classroom sizes to 28, 29 students a room at Jackson seems to be working in reverse, in our opinion. Part of the magic of Elmhurst as a community is the school system. You should be very, very proud of that. We certainly are. The conversation finds us a bit as, at a crossroads as to how this shapes our school system for years to come. Thank you. Okay, Michelle Reedy. Good evening. Um, I'd like to address the board regarding target class sizes for upper elementary grades. My children attend Jackson Elementary School. Presently, my son's second grade class is split into four sections. Next year, these same students will be split into three sections, averaging between 28 and 29 students per class. My concern with these target size classes include student learning, teacher workload, and classroom space. As class sizes grow beyond suggested targets, our students suffer. Bigger classes equals less time for conferencing with students during reading, writing, and math workshop times. By increasing class sizes beyond targets set by Dr. Moyer and the board, our highest and lowest achieving students will fall behind. Instead of closing the achievement gap, we'll be lowering student achievement across the board. These academic losses will not be easily recouped. The impact of smaller class sizes has lasting effects. According to a 2016 report by the National Education Policy Center, meta studies conducted as early as the 1970s show that students who are assigned to smaller classes were more likely to graduate in four years, more likely to go to college, and more likely to get a degree in a STEM field compared to their peers in larger classes. If District 205 hopes to remain a high achieving district with increasing ACT and SAT scores, our class sizes must reflect our commitment to student success and our goal to close the achievement gap. Our expectations of our teachers in District 205 are great. We ask that they implement engaging student-centered lessons, plans built around an ever-changing curriculum, sometimes in the middle of the school year, as was the case with the ELA curriculum this year, uh, that meets state regulated standards. We ask them to document student growth, communicate with parents regarding student achievement, differentiate both teaching style and materials for students with IEPs, engage high achieving students, and all the while address the needs of our students as children or the whole person as it were. Each student we add to a classroom makes our teacher's job more difficult. We simply can't expect our teachers to accommodate the individual needs of 29 students. 
I know the board is eager to have District 205 be a model for 21st century future ready classrooms, multi-use spaces with furniture that's multifunctional and support student learning. However, it's my understanding that the classrooms next year will be traditional classrooms, which include a desk and chair for each student, teacher's desks, classroom libraries, multimedia and technology, technology centers. I was able to see what a 29 student classroom will look like firsthand. They are going to wind up looking more like holding cells instead of learning zones. Once we put 29 desks, 29 students, a teacher, a one-on-one -on -one aid, perhaps two, adaptive equipment for our students with special needs, these stop becoming uh, classrooms and turn into holding pens. Despite John Hades' poorly constructed argument to the contrary that Dr. Moyer and the school board have used in defense of ever-increasing target class sizes, class size does matter. Experts agree that class size is an important determinant of student outcomes and one that can be directly determined by policy. Many parents are here tonight as a call to action. We demand that class sizes be conducive to student success and will tolerate nothing less. Our goal is to have District 205 class sizes reflect the state average of 21 students. Thanks for your time. To be Steph Prawn. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is the first time I'm doing this, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to be more succinct. Um, I'm here as the parent of a second grader at Jackson School, my uh, Zoe Steph Prawn. She's in Mrs. Hershey's class. She she loves her teacher essentially. Um, the concern that I have here and that everybody else has raised was about the class size, and not only the class size, but also maybe the approach and the view that uh, the board might have on solving this problem. Um, we've been told that by adding technology and by investing in, in, in other uh, educational materials, we might get uh, a, an acceptable solution with a larger class size, but actually I would like to disagree with that. Um, mostly because uh, of my extensive, extensive experience in, in, in school. So I, I might be one of the most educated, over-educated people in the room. I have 26 years of formal education starting from the first grade through a bunch of uh, advanced degrees. And I can tell you that uh, really what mattered in all these years were, were the exposure to the teachers, to their passion, and, and to how they presented the materials. Also, there is evidence from, from other states, from other states, uh, California, for instance, mandates decreasing the number of uh, students in class uh, at to around 20. Tennessee had an experiment around um, smaller class sizes versus larger class sizes, which, which shows what the other parents highlighted, that essentially it's, it's better to have smaller class sizes. Um, I'm, I'm here to ask, just like everybody else, for teachers, right? And, and, and uh, not just for my kid, who, like I mentioned, really loves her teacher, but also uh, for all the other kids that we saw here today. They are all winners in their competitions because of the teachers, because, because the teachers put in uh, the effort and the passion to help them out. And, and of course, the kids are also great, but, but it's, a, it's a partnership there. Um, I'm not only here as a parent, right? I mean, I'm, I'm here like everybody else uh, um, because these kids are our future and they, they are there to support us. From my perspective, my kids are my retirement fund. That's, you know, I mean, it is what it is. And I'm hoping that they will be successful so I'll have good retirement. And, and, and really, really, th these kids are there to, to uh, make sure that the United States is and is going to stay a healthy, powerful, economic, and innovative country that it is today. And I'm hoping that with, with adding teachers to, to our classrooms, we're going to achieve that. Thank you so much. Nardini. Hi, everybody. My name is Guido Nardini. I have far less prepared uh, 
remarks than everybody else here. Uh, I'm a Jackson dad. I rise to speak also about uh, class size. Um, and I wanted to kind of take sort of a different tack. Let's assume that the academic jury is still out. Let's assume that an argument could be made that class size doesn't matter. There's a Dobian Fryer uh, 2011 Harvard thing that was, I think, 40 years long, and it says class size doesn't really matter. There's other stuff on the other side, Baker, Ferry, and Shara, uh, that says class size does. But let's say that that's immaterial. Um, something that I think is irrefutable is uh, District 205 is sort of a jewel. Uh, the people who were up here earlier, the first place in state, national awards that they were just receiving is a testament to that. And as people like me who are leaving CPS in droves are looking at Northbrook, Hinsdale, Elmhurst, Deerfield, and they're judging things, they're looking at ACT score, they're looking at median home value, <laughs> ACT scores, SAT scores, and class size, full stop regardless of what the academics say, full stop, they're looking at that. And a class size of 28 will remove a lot of people from the prospective new Elmhurst move-ins that a class size of 21.5 won't. Um, I see District 205 as a jewel because I grew up here and I moved back here uh, at the beginning of this school year to raise my kids here. I have a second grader and a third grader at Jackson and I'm largely thrilled with 205. So what I implore of the board is what's the workaround? How do we make this work? How do we not go from 21 to 28? And before the next meeting on the 23rd, I hope that somebody can educate me why that's not doable. Thank you. Shana Robachek. Thank you to the Board of Education for serving District 2R5 as our elected leaders. We appreciate your time. My name is Shauna Rubicek and I have a fourth grader, second grader, and kindergartner at Hawthorne with another who will enter in the fall of 2019. I'm concerned about the direction in which class sizes are going at Hawthorne as well as Jackson and Lincoln Elementary schools. One study cited determines that class size does not, in fact, matter. To this, I say, let's all agree to respectfully disagree on this study as many others will conclude quite the opposite. I've learned about target numbers and standards throughout the district. What I've also learned is that our target numbers are higher than the average class size throughout the state of Illinois, as cited by the Illinois report card from the Illinois State Board of Education. The class sizes in third grade at these three elementary schools will be well above the state average number of 23. Class size does matter. Ask the growing third grader who needs to stretch out. Ask the group of kids who need space from each other throughout the day with personalities as diverse as are their styles of learning. Ask your child if she felt seen and heard and helped as an individual in class today. Ask the specials teachers who have limited time and resources with these children each week in their classrooms. Ask the teacher who has up to 29 distinct personalities to manage each day, as well as the email and voicemail messages from parents. Finally, ask us, the parents. This is a priority to us. This matters to us. I'm concerned that slowly these class size numbers will creep up and eventually we will be expected to accept 29 children in one class as the norm. To me, this is not acceptable. Malia Smith at District 205 sent the following statement, I quote, the district has invested $1 million in counting in instructional coaches to support all teachers with lesson planning, technology, special education, and English language learners. In addition, professional learning communities have been a focus to develop common assessments and increase emphasis on professional development through the sharing of best practices. All of these factors combine to create, encourage, and support one of the most important indicators of student success, a highly qualified and effective teacher." End quote. All of these additional resources are great and I applaud them, but all of these resources are outside of the classroom. It still does not change the fact that the number of students in each third grade class will be just too many. Our teachers are effective because they have to be. 
That does not mean that we cannot make it our priority to make each classroom the most ideal environment for both our teachers and our children. One million dollars and counting to support our teachers. What about some of that for simply more teachers? When I look at our school's class size numbers, I see average, and actually based on the previously mentioned class sizes throughout the state, we in District 205 are below average. I'm confident when I say that the majority of the parents in this room, when looking for their new home in Elmhurst, looked at schools and they were looking for outstanding. They were looking for unique, robust, exceptional educational experiences for their children. We all are looking for above average, and I, for one, did not move to Elmhurst for my kids to experience ordinary. I moved here for extraordinary. I hope that you will take seriously our concerns and reevaluate the arbitrary target numbers to get them more in line with what we, the parents of the District 205 community, want to see in our elementary schools. Thank you. Christy Phipps. Good evening. My name is Christy Phipps, and my oldest child is currently a second grader at Lincoln. We've been informed that the number of sections will decrease from five to four when my child returns as a third grader in the fall. We have 108 students currently enrolled in this grade, and that means our class size will go from 21 and a half to 27. I'm asking the board to reconsider its decision to increase class sizes for next year's third graders at Lincoln. My children are young. My second grader is my oldest. I recognize that this is not a new issue for school districts across the country, but it's new for me. It's top of mind for parents and community members. I recognize that the board is in a unique decision to balance both the students' best interests and the financial needs of the district. I recently inquired about the rationale for this class size increase by email. I'm appreciative that Mrs. Abner chose to respond on behalf of the board. In her response, she informed me that the district established current class size targets six years ago to monitor fluctuations in class sizes. For grades K through two, the target's 25, and for, three to, for grades three to five, the target's 27. The target changes when our students move from second to third grade. From this rationale, I'm inferring that the number of sections third graders at Lincoln is not being decreased because one, we need another, gr another grade needs a classroom, or because we'll be using the room for a new initiative like full-time kindergarten or even due to budget concerns. Instead, the decision has been made to increase class sizes and keep a classroom vacant just to hit a target. The reality is that we have not been applying this target at Lincoln. For example, during the 2013-14 school year, the third grade class had 110 students, which is almost identical to our current situation. And they maintained five sections of 20 student, two students in third, fourth, and fifth grade. They just um, left Lincoln last year. As you're aware, the physical condition, physical Lincoln building is outdated. Our classrooms are too small for 27 students. The HVAC systems can't even handle the 21 students that are currently in my child's classroom, let alone six more warm little bodies. In most classrooms, we don't have cubbies to keep the students' belongings in their places. Instead, we have closets and classrooms with hooks only a few inches apart. And those little lice just jump from one sweatshirt to the next. We just got another lice information today, this morning. The 2016 Educational Line Rate Report by White & Company presents data on each of the district's buildings. Lincoln's gross square footage per student is only 115 square feet, compared to the target of 125 to 155. Removing classrooms from student use essentially lowers the square footage number even further from the target. Finally, I've been an active participant in the Focus 205 process and been so proud to live in a district where the school board and the superintendent really wants to know what the community want. In the thought exchange phase of the Focus 205 process, we had the opportunity to provide feedback online. The number one response to the question, what are your thoughts about our future learning environments, was class size. I, want, I ask you to consider what is best for our students, what our schools can physically handle, and what's a priority to the community. Please maintain five sections for my child's class at Lincoln next year and keep the class sizes low in the future. Thank you.
Thank you. Kristen Morrow. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Morrow, and I have three daughters who are or will be attending Lincoln Elementary School. I am an educator who holds a master's degree in education, am an advocate for children, and firmly believe in best practices to optimize learning. I'm standing here today because I have become increasingly concerned with the direction our school district is going and the impact this direction has on my children's education. After learning that third grade class sizes at Lincoln will start out at 27 students per class next year, I was frankly appalled. And that's just to start the year with the option to keep going up in size. It doesn't take a master's degree or any form of a background in education to know that smaller classes increase differentiation of curriculum and offer much more individualized instruction to our students. My husband and I value public education. We based our decision to move to Elmhurst in large part because of District 205. Unfortunately, since this new administration has been established, we can't help but notice that practically every major change being made is at our children's educational detriment. In fact, five out of the 13 criteria that helped Lincoln Elementary receive its prestigious blue ribbon status have been cut. That's over 38%. And now this latest decision to remove a section of third grade leading to increased class size. For me, this one stings the most. Because, and let's be clear about this point, there can be no defense for this decision other than financial gain. Please don't use John Hattie's debunked research regarding class size like you've done in the past. It's purely about cutting costs. But the irony is costs are not being cut because this administration doesn't save money, rather they spend it. I was extremely vocal at the Focus 205 forums and believed my opinions mattered. I spoke out against the implementation of the 21st century futuristic classroom at Lincoln specifically. Lincoln, a non-handicap accessible school that has mice, leaky pipes, and unusable learning space. I equated putting a 21st century classroom in dilapidated Lincoln Elementary, like putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. But the model futuristic classroom is up and running while my fifth grader still reports sightings of mouse droppings. When reflecting on what is best for children, here is my one request, Board and Dr. Moyer. Slow down, time is precious, our children matter. Always guide your educational decisions on what is best for our children. More individualized attention and meeting the needs of all learners should be your key. Please rethink the value of smaller class sizes at Lincoln Elementary. It's what's best for educate, educators and our students. Thank you. Um, uh, Renee Palowski. Hello, my name is Renee Pulaski. I have a fifth grader and a second grader at Lincoln and an incoming kindergarten next year. I am here to speak against the proposed increase in class sizes of the third grade classes next year at Lincoln, Jackson, and Hawthorne. While I don't have a background in education myself, I come from a family of educators and have a number of close friends who work both as classroom teachers and administrators. Each one of them I have spoken with agree that class size is one of the most important factors and not only the quality of relationships they form with students, but their ability to effectively provide a high quality education. Any reduction in class size increases the probability that students will be on task positively engaged in learning. Increasing class size puts a huge burden on teachers who are already grappling with adjusting to the new ELA and math curriculums District 205 has adopted. I understand the new curriculums require conferencing with students in math, reading, and writing, and in addition, the new spelling 
is more differentiated than the previous spelling curriculum, breaking the students down into more groups, requiring even more conferencing from teachers who are already spread too thin in already overcrowded, overcrowded classrooms. Every student wants to be heard, wants to be conferenced with, wants their teacher's attention, wants to feel important, and wants help when something is challenging for them. For many elementary students, the highlight of their day is when their teacher jokes with him or her, pays them special attention, or makes a personal connection with them. At a time when child anxiety and stress is at an all-time high and a greater number of students have IEPs and 504s each year, I don't feel it is in the children of District 205's best interest to increase class sizes. I understand data-driven instruction, but we have to put best practices in place for our children in District 205. Children need nurturing, conversations with relationships with their teachers, and not just to be numbers or test scores. If anyone else is here tonight to show they oppose class size increases, please raise your hand. Thank you for your attention. Heather, Heather Stats. Heather? Is Heather Stats here? Okay, we're going to move on. Thank you for your comments. We will take in, the, take in all the comments and, and respond. We are going to move on to reports and presentations, student services. Kathy. Thank you, um, members of the Board of Education, community members. Um, I'm uh, appreciative of the opportunity to share with you some information about our student services department and an update. Um, last year, we had the opportunity to meet uh, in a learning t and teaching committee meeting and we went into a little bit more detail. So we'll give a little bit of overcap of some of that stuff of where we are today, but then also looking ahead for next steps. So I have a few individuals with me um, that are a part of our core team, Susan Condrat, who is our preschool principal, and Melissa Delarosa, who couldn't be here this evening, but as the student services assistant principal at York, she's a part of our team as well. Kim James and Bridget Peterson are our two elementary um, program supervisors uh, Jason Vanderplow our middle school um, program supervisor Jill Mueller our department chairperson at York and then Brandon Mixon um, our high school um, program supervisor and together we make up the core team and we are really proud of that ability to have that EC 12 perspective so we are meeting to ensure that consistency across the levels as well as how we look at program implementation not only for the differences um, that our individual students have but across each of the different levels so they're going to be taking turns with me this evening um, and having opportunity to speak with you as well. So there's gonna be a little bit of shuffling back and forth, so we appreciate your patience with that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan to get started. 
So I also get to tell you about all the members of the Department of, of Student Services. The department is, employs currently about 160 licensed duo, District 205 staff members comprised of special education teachers who are the case managers for students with IEPs and they also provide differentiation for students in specific instruction. We also have social workers that work and provide social emotional support. We have speech and language pathologists who work on receptive and expressive language, articulation delays, phonological processing, building vocabulary, pragmatic language, a variety of different things. We have psychologists who, who help with the RTI process, which we'll be talking about a little bit more later. School counselors, who are case managers for students with 504 plans, deans who work with students and families to be successful, and we have itinerant staff, which are occupational therapists, physical therapists, vision itinerants, and hearing itinerants who all come to us through the Department of um, Special Education Cooperative in SASID. We also have nursing services, and then educational assistants are all under the umbrella of student services, so we have quite a few people to talk to you about today. Thank you. Um, These are the different responsibilities and I'm gonna take a few moments. Um, some things will go into a little bit more depth, again, focusing on the things that are different this year for us and as we're moving ahead. One of the things that um, last year we went to a new online IEP system and this year in working with some of our middle school related services, as you've seen the growth in the Section 504 plans, another way that we provide services for our students, um, that has an impact on just some of the logistics and then the continuity between plans and services across the district. So in January we moved to, I, I began working with um, our uh, an outside vendor that we were currently using for something else to bring that up to date with our Section 504. So starting in March, all of our 504 plans will be moved to um, the same online system that houses our IEPs, which gives teachers greater accessibility. Um, not that we weren't doing a good job with our standalone paper um, 504 plans, but it makes a huge difference. And as this growth has impacted um, the buildings and how not only teachers are supporting those students, but how our related services staff are assisting with that. And we'll continue that implementation through next year because it takes a whole calendar year to get all students into the system. Hi. Um, some of the our nursing services, um, we continue the relationship with um, Edwards Elmer's Hospital. Um, each of our buildings has an assistant nurse who's also an RN, and they usually take care of the everyday goings on of the school. Um, you know, playground injuries and meds, and it makes sure the immunizations are updated and everything. Um, we also have 4.5. FTE for a certified nurse and these nurses hold a professional education license. They conduct um, evaluations, health histories, vision and hearing screenings. They also do the early childhood screenings. They sit in our 504 and IEP meetings and they're part of the team in making decisions for our students. Um, there's also going to be a little change with how school counselors, they're seeing a change over the next two years. Um, with a, they're going to go to what they call the, the ramp model. Um, it's where they kind of switch the, the role of, now it's kind of one-to-one, -one when they switch to an RTI model where they'll kind of go in mass and kind of funnel down to one-to-one -to, -one to see the needs. Um, they will do that through data-driven and look at the data to see what's in the needs. Um, and they're going to do this within their PLCs. Uh, which is kind of done with those early morning and the early releases. Um, this past uh, late May, early June, I shared with you um, some a, a new state um, expectation with Senate Bill 100, and it really looked at the way that schools were implementing their discipline policies. policies particularly those um, incidents that led to exclusionary discipline uh, measures such as um, out-of-school suspension and in-school suspension. And that's based on across the nation what we see in what we call the pipeline from school ex exclusion to things outside of school that don't necessarily help our students. Um, and so the whole idea behind Senate Bill 100 
uh, has been to have schools look at their discipline policies as well as how they're managing student behavior. This links in very closely with our PBIS and how we're trying to make sure we have positive systems, which we've had um, before you also the PBIS um, recognition that our schools have received. So I have to give a lot of credit here to our high school deans, our um, middle school assistant principals, our principals and our counsel counselors um, recognition here, how they have met this with just open arms because it aligns with what they are always trying to work with students. There are obviously times that students do receive discipline consequences, but when they're working with students, their whole focus is restorative justice and how can we help that student be successful? And when I sat with them and we went to some of the um, trainings across the, st the state, the, the one thing that became very clear to us is it wasn't a significant change for us in how we were doing business because it just honed our focus even more on how we could keep school students in school we know they're better off here. There are absolutely times when we feel that that's an appropriate consequence and exclusionary, but um, this particular um, ISBE regu regulation has really aligned well with our practices and all the, they've expanded on what those restorative systems are using some of those practices, not only from student to student, but sometimes between adult and student, because as we know that teacher-student relationship is, is important to the student learning environment. So in response to intervention, the student services ta staff has a leadership role in um, analyzing data and meeting with grade level teams, a minimum of three times yearly. Some grade level teams in schools meet more often. Um, and at those meetings, they look at the data, they determine what students might need additional support in identified areas, look at what students might need to look at a new intervention to increase their learning um, and make some changes for students in the areas of academics, behavioral, and social emotional concerns. Next year, we have the acceleration time that's going to be built in into the K-5 and the middle school um, schedules and this came out of the middle school task force. Um, during that acceleration time students will be able to receive direct targeted instruction in identified areas of need from special education teachers, interventionists, related service staff, um, and also the classroom teachers and there will also be opportunities for students who need enrichment to receive it at those times as well. This will help us preserve that core instruction block for our students and allow them to be participating with their general education peers and then be receiving additional instruction at another time during the school day. I didn't flip my page. My apologies. Um, so next year, one thing that we're working on is a universal screening tool in the area of social emotional learning. Um, so we want to try and gather some data that would help us catch students more in that tier two, um, students who need a little bit more support. Um, and doing the screener would allow us to collect some additional data in that area. Next year, we're going to start with a pilot with a small group. Um, and once we've completed the pilot, we'll look at full implementation district wide to collect that data and then provide interventions accordingly. This slide captures the numbers of students that we serve um, with um, receiving special education services. So if you look at the 2016 and 2017, those are numbers um, that were actually captured in December of the previous year through our ISTAR, which is our state reporting system. So you can see the total enrollment of students um, within the district and in each grade level. The parentheses um, are those students who are receiving special education services and therefore that creates the percentage. I think what's most um, notable about the slide is you can see that at most levels across the district we've seen an increase in the number of students we're serving just not just in terms of number but also in percentage to the general ed population. The next slide shows um, the increases in each individual breakdown of the different areas of disability. Uh, the ones that are underlined are the ones that we've seen an increase. There's been marked increase with a specific learning disability and emotional disabilities over the last year. To talk a little bit about 
children's participation in the general education program. As many of, many of you know, um, at Madison, when we start off students, most of the students are participating in a general education environment. We're really happy to be able to go ahead and out of our 22 sessions of students that we serve, only three of them are self-contained right now. So the rest of them are all blended classrooms with their general education peers that are in there with them. And we're providing services to a majority of those students inside that classroom so they get those exposure to those typical peers. When you're also taking a look at the participation in general education, that's the least restrictive environment for students to participate in. So we're also going ahead and going to talk to you a little bit about what that looks like as they start to transition into the older grades um, and go through a K-12 perspective. When they go into the K-12 perspective, right now they talk about the percentage of the day that they're spending inside the general education setting. So when it goes from 80% um, or more of the day within general education, 40 to 79% of the day within the general education setting, less than 40% of the day within the general education setting, and then as it gets more restrictive, it goes to a public day school than, or than those private therapy private therapeutic day schools. Most of the students within District 205, as you'll see, and I'll let my, the rest of the colleagues talk about that, is they are, we are happy that we are serving a large portion of our students 80% of the 80% of the time or more inside a general education setting. Uh, this slide just shows um, the K-12 participation in general education of our special needs students. Um, as you can see, the, the greatest is in the 80% or more of the time. Um, the right, remaining slides break it out by K-5, K 6, 8, and the high school. Um, so the, uh, the OP private means um, outside placement. OP public is outside placement as well. Those outside public schools are more of our SASID um, vision. They have some vision programs and some hearing programs in, the, in a general education school. So that's what an outside public placement is. I just didn't know if you I clarify. As you can see at the K-5 level, we're serving the majority of our students in the general education classroom for 80% or more of the day. Um, so when looking at those students, um, they're being serviced through either a push-in, where the, the special education teacher goes into the classroom to provide services to the student, a co-teaching model where the, the special education teacher is working collaboratively with the general education teacher to provide services, or um, in direct instruction in a smaller environment based on specific student need. Um, those, those students have access to the core curriculum, they have access to their gen ed peers. Um, at the high school, those te some of those teachers are content specific in the areas of English, math, things like that. Um, and at the middle school, we're working um, toward having uh, co-teachers share common planning time so that they're able to plan for those students who are being served in the general education classroom. And at the middle school level, uh, most of our students participate in the general education setting um, as well, about 68%. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, LREO2, um, which is students that participate in the general education setting 40 to 79% of the day. And some of the differences between uh, students that are spending more than 79% in, in uh, general education and these students would be uh, the level of support that they need. So they may need uh, some additional instruction in, say, English language arts or math. Um, and, and, um, you know, just requiring additional supports throughout their day um, uh, from special education teachers or related service providers. Um, I'm going to talk about the kids that are in kind of less than 40% of the day in the general education setting. These are the students that need a little bit more instructional supports. Um, they may have more related services um, where they still have access to the common course standards, but they need them differentiated more on an individual level according to their IEP. Um, also talk about outplace public. I know you'll look at the high school and you'll say, uh, why is it so much bigger than all the rest of them? Um, that's because it includes our transition center. Um, so there are over 30 students at the transition center. Uh, it started over 30 students. And then um, our outplaced private numbers are a little bit bigger too, uh, but that also incorporates that we get all the students that kind of come up through, and then they can stay up until the day before their 22nd birthday. So we represent more, more like eight grades rather than four. Um, 
Um, in the area of professional development, so we're working with um, the general education staff to provide professional development to our teachers. Um, we noted before that 64% of our students district-wide are participating in the general education classroom 80% or more of their day. And because of that, we want our special education teachers to be, pro uh, to be participating in the same professional development in the core curriculum areas as our general education teachers so that they have knowledge of that core curriculum, ways to adapt it, ways to modify it, and ways to help differentiate and include our students. Um, we're always looking for that balance between providing them targeted uh, professional development in their area of expertise as well as the general education. And then uh, student services professional development. We um, have hosted the Illinois Autism Part Partnership. Um, that's usually hosted in the summer. Uh, it's available to both general education and special education teachers district-wide. Uh, and the goal of the Illinois Autism Partnership is to build uh, capacities in, in school districts statewide so that may, they may provide effective programming for students with an autism spectrum disorder. Uh, we also provide um, professional development uh, through our cooperative SACID uh, with the Crisis Prevention Institute. Uh, CPI um, is training that's provided to staff members to promote uh, safety and security to students and or staff members uh, through many de-escalation techniques. Uh, there is also a small component that is a physical management if there is a crisis situation. Um, but this is available to special education teachers, general education teachers, administration related service staff providers, PSRP staff. Um, Uh, discipline specific conferences for example our speech and language pathologists have been able to participate in ASHA and our school psychologists have been able to participate in ISPA uh, instructional strategies within small group settings for special ed teachers and math and reading uh, we've provided for vertical articulation kindergarten through transition level to develop a continuum of transition services for students identified as uh, special education that may be more uh, impacted by their disabilities and require some additional services moving forward um, after they even exit um, their education at age 22. Um, We've provided transition planning, and we also have provided professional development uh, with our um, electronic um, IEP system, uh, Power IEP, to our teachers, as well as provided them with um, IEP best practice training. This past fall, Dr. Moyer, Dr. Hendersonbaum, myself, Jason, and the three middle school principals um, had the opportunity to attend ICLE's conference, and its focus was meeting the, the needs of diverse learners, including those students that might be considered e you know, English language learners at risk and special education. Um, a strong focus on transforming the instruction within general education, as well as any classroom, including um, those um, classroom environments that might be more self-contained in nature and at that conference we had an opportunity to as they built into the conference for us to work as a team and one of the outcomes of that was how we could look at improving not only the co-teaching that we currently had taking place in our middle schools but increasing those um, co-teaching partnerships and those opportunities for students during the day and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we did with that information here in a minute um, and then just recently just this last week um, our, many of us here as well as many of our teachers across the district and some of our parents as well um, attended in Illinois it includes a conference conference which was just right here in Oak Brook and um, it was a, a little bit of a unique conference in that it tailored to both um, families um, providers both within a school system and other kinds of providers outside of the school system as well and um, good conference a lot of good um, speakers from across the country and some some of our teachers saw some folks that they really like that they want us to consider bringing back um, as we look to planning some of our PD sessions um, that they saw would be beneficial not just for our special education teachers but for some of our general education teachers as well and it would tie right back into our um, student goals of um, or our student objectives of student engagement and improving instruction. 
And then, as I said earlier, when we were at um, ICLE conference this last fall, we started talking um, with the middle school principals and how we can do that. So this, um, this last March, um, myself, Jason, and the three middle school principals, uh, along with um, two co-teaching teams from each of our middle schools, um, partnered with SASID, as, as you know, we're a part of the SASID quote, cooperative and myself and Jason had met with them previously to say this is our focus this is our goal of what we want to be doing and the important thing that SESA could provide for us was not only us starting off a kickoff meeting with some Im job and you know with embedded PD with just our staff of what are some of those structures within a co-teaching model that um, get you better results so when you look at um, co-teaching structures. There's a lot of different instructional strategies that can take place in a co-teaching environment, but some of them get you better results on student achievement. For example, one teacher, one assist, there's absolutely a time for that and a value, but it also has um, the, the most minimum value in terms of student achievement. So looking at more of that true co-teaching, whether that's parallel teaching, flexible grouping, um, you know, changing the groups up from day to day or sub or content to content. So we met with those teachers and as a piece of that, um, I think when you heard Ariana speak, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, about bilingual programming for next year, that that also has the opportunity to move to a co-teaching model. So we included our EL teachers in this training. Um, then after the training in March, the SASID support staff that we assigned one per each building, they've been going in and meeting with the two each of the two teams um, they've gone in and done some observations, given them feedback, uh, much like what our coaches are doing, so it's a way for us to emulate that. But what has <coughs> been um, somewhat unique to this is it was specifically targeted on co-teaching. And one of the things that um, when we were planning with SASID, it was, um, is, is very, I was very proud to say, we're not trying to garner commitment to this as a model and how this is beneficial to students, that's not where our teachers are. They're very committed to it. They know it's valuable. So what we were doing and what we've been doing is building their skill set and what they need in order to get better at the um, the co-teaching partnership. And one of the biggest keys is, of which you, it, it makes sense, would be that common planning time during the week for those two partners to be able to sit down and plan together. And actually just today, the middle school principals and I and Jason met to be looking at the schedule for next year. And we'll talk a little bit about um, later on what that looks like for next year. We've been fortunate this year to collaborate with our related service providers and bring in presenters for professional development that are related to their specific disciplines. Um, for example, we had a speaker come in on dialectical behavior therapy across the Mar January and March institutes, and they met with the social workers, the counselors, and the school psychologists um, to increase their knowledge base in that area. And that was specific just to them. Um, we also had a speaker come in and work with the speech pathologist on flexible delivery model um, and, and push-in services within the classroom. And then we also um, offered some uh, sessions during our January and March institutes that were specific to some of their disciplines as well, but that were available to both general education and special education teachers. And when looking at the attendance of those sessions, we saw that they were attended um, almost half and half by general education and special education teachers. So we were able to provide sessions on school anxiety, calm classroom, which is on mindfulness in the classroom, as well as social thinking, which focuses on pragmatic language and self-awareness. Um, we've also, uh, on the late starts, myself, uh, Ms. James, Mr. Vanderplow, and Ms. Mueller have provided professional development to our PSRP support staff um, on a variety of topics, including ADHD, um, verbal de-escalation, and increasing student engagement. So, right now. Um, at the high school for next year, it's going to be exciting. We're adding 10 sections of co-taught, um, which is going to be real nice, so we're going to increase that. Um, we'll also be uh, adding some instructional coaching in the area of co-teaching and some more professional development to continue to build those relationships. Um, also, we're going to add um, an emotional disabilities program uh, where it'll be a little bit more self-contained, housed in York, um, geared towards students who typically kind of go outplacement for private outplacement, um, or withdraw or transfer to other schools for for a smaller setting um, so now we're going to be able to house that in york it's it's going to be a pretty cool opportunity i think we'll keep lots of kids in district
preschool next year will be working on applying for the Award of Excellence in Inclusion Programming because we are really proud of our, of our inclusion practices right now. So that's going to be our focus for next year is that we're going to be applying, applying for that Award of Excellence, much like the one that we want for cultural and linguistically appropriate practices. This will be the next step in going forward with inclusion programming. And then, and then to wrap it up, um, we talked earlier about the acceleration period and what that means. And we do expect that to have some scheduling impacts on some of our students. Like Bridget mentioned, a big advantage of that acceleration time um, dedicated within a school is students are, we're preserving that core instruction. So when we look at um, scheduling of our related services providers, including our special education teachers, reading specialists, EL, and so forth, there will be some scheduling impacts on how we make sure that we get a lot of those needs met during that acceleration time. But to be clear, not every student's needs can be met in just that short amount of time. When we look at the different students' needs, there's other, there's students that will need support throughout the other parts of their day as well. Um, I was just talking about the middle school co-teaching and where we, will where we will take that next year. Um, we are um, anticipating two um, an ELA and a math co-teaching team at each grade level at each of our three middle schools. We will be continuing with that job embedded um, PD and f provided through our relationship with SASID. And then as we look to add earlier in March, we talked about adding instructional coaches that will have a special ed education lens. We've all been involved in that in interviewing process along with our building principals. And we would look for our instructional coaches that come to the table with more of a special education lens and how we can be more inclusive to help continue to move that forward and how that might look in um, elementary school. And um, Jill and Brandon and the instructional coach that we will have assigned to our high school. Jill will talk a little bit more about that. And we're continuing and working with our general education peers in terms of implementing elementary reading um, as we've gone to the school ride wide resources and the comprehensive literacy curriculum that we're implementing and next year with um, Dave Beatty and as our special education teachers will be working with our gen ed teachers not only how we implement Eureka math um, in the gen ed setting for our students but when we're supporting and supplementing the students time outside of the gen ed of how we can do that so students are successful in the um, in the general education math curriculum. I just want to say a couple words about transition planning. The focus of the March Institute was vertical articulation, and so a subset of the special education staff got together across grade levels to talk about the process of transition planning as it applies to what teachers need to do, do um, to promote good uh, continuum of services for students, and how to get information out to parents so that they can be actively planning for their child's future outside of the public school system. Uh, the consensus when we got together is that we wanted more time to be able to uh, plan longitudinally, longitudinally for um, all of our students. Um, and so we look forward to getting together. Uh, the plan is we have a, a dedicated group of volunteers who are gonna come together and work on this uh, throughout the year and we look forward to rolling out that um, opportunity to share the information with teachers and with families. Thank you. We appreciate your time this evening. Are there questions from the board? Kira, you want to start? First of all, thank you for doing the presentation and working with our most vulnerable kids because that, you know, it's a lot of work. It's challenging work, so thank you. Um, could you describe, and if you did and I missed it in the presentation, uh, just elaborate, give a little more detail on what co-teaching looks like? Sure. Um, when we talk about co-teaching, what we do is we dedicate that time in the teacher's day for that classroom. Um, if that class is five days a week for 50 minutes right now, that's what we're co-teaching. So as we look in the middle school, that's going to change a little bit when we get to that ELA block. That's now a math block is 75 minutes, and I think ELA was 90 minutes. 
please don't tell Mary I couldn't remember the exact number. Um, but both of those teachers, a special education teacher and a general education teacher, that is part that is built into their day. And then when we look at the schedule of students in that classroom, it does not mean that every student with an IEP is put in a co-teaching classroom. That would not be an appropriate classroom. Um, the state of Illinois, and we absolutely understand and appreciate and respect and value this, um, requires that a general education classroom can have no more than 30% of the students that identify to be receiving special education services. That does exclude students who are receiving speech and language only, like especially at our elementary school where they might be working on a, a, an articulation um, or pho phonemic um, goal. But for a student that has an IEP for other reasons, only 30% of the students max can be in that co-teaching classroom or in any gen ed classroom. Um, and then the rest of the students have to be, um, must be considered a general education student. So those two teachers have common planning time. And then the goal is you're bringing in the IEP goals as well as the curriculum. And, you, and those two teachers, when they're looking at how they're planning just the, the instruction for five days a week or however many days that class meets, then they're looking at it through the lens of how do we support not only those students that have an IEP, but how, what other instructional strategies do two people being in the classroom afford them to be able to do? So again, not every student that has an IEP um, is going to be receiving services in a co-teaching because that's not appropriate for every student. There are some students that may need more intensive services or there are some students that may not need that level of services and that may look just more like a push-in where a teacher might be going in for so much, uh, a special education teacher might be going into the general education classroom so, for so many minutes during the day or during the week to um, implement those student goals or to, to look be working with the gen ed teacher on what the accommodations and modifications would be looking like. Could you just review the high school counseling slide for me again? I, I wasn't quite completely able to follow. So one of the things, and, and Melissa apologizes for not being here, she um, is attending a conference with Dr. Henderson Baum. So one of the things that, if you, if you think about what we said in terms of eligibility, and we're seeing a growth in one of the areas in the emotional disabilities, one of the things that our high school counselors and high school deans and high school social workers have been seeing is as they're working with students in a one-on-one -on -one model, absolutely that's beneficial for students and they wanna make sure that they still have time to do that when a student needs it. But it's also important, just like if we looked at um, math or reading, we wanna know what is happening in our tier one, what data do we look at, and what do we need to do in our tier one and our tier two where we might say that tier three is more of that one-on-one. -on -one. So um, this past um, March Institute, Melissa De La Rosa and I met with our 612 um, counselors, social workers, deans, SLPs, and school psychologists and saying what is in our RTI process that's working and what do we need to shore up on. And when you get to a high school, if you, if you, I think I am confident in saying, if you talk to any um, of individuals like myself or Melissa De La Rosa or a high school counselor in any large high school, some of those systems that work really, really well in our elementary and our middle school gets way more complicated when you talk about 2,700 students all with a different schedule every day. So this particular model that they're looking at is um, more geared toward what the RTI systems in a school counseling program that looks at using group in tier one and tier two supports, as well as the, the commitment to still working with individual students when we need to. And I think um, if, if we think about what you've heard 
uh, Mrs. DeLuga and R Ryan Daugherty talk about, we're not only college, but we're looking at career ready and other areas that life readiness for students. The comprehensive model that um, the American School Counselor Association looks at, look, like what are we doing for all of our students? And so what Melissa and the student services team at York want to want to work with this process to to improve the services that we have for students we love what we they love what they do for students they're they feel very strongly and I think when you talk to a lot of our families they value the work of our counselors and the work of our social workers and our psychologists and and we want to be able to continue to do that stuff but as we see more students and we want to expand what we're doing we have to do that in a more systemic way and what data do we use to help determine what we need to be doing as more of a tier one in a tier one or tier two for our students and not just that individual one-on-one -on -one with students. I have several questions. Thank you so much for um, the update. Um, for us, the, you know, all of the board and the public, uh, in addition to, I know you presented, you said earlier to the learning and teaching committee. Oh, okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first question that I have is kind of give us a sense of, um, I'm going to assume in general terms that the curriculum is, is the same for our general education students as the students that you're identifying here. Is that kind of a baseline that we, we want to use? Yes, when you go back to where we talked about that most of our students spend 80% of their day um, or more in a general education setting. Now that might mean the special education or the related service provider is going into that gen ed setting with them. But so our whole goal there and idea requires us to start with least restrictive environment, which is always gen ed. Now least restrictive environment can be defined differently for each individual student. Matter of fact, that's what we have, that's what we must do. We must define what that looks like for a student. So to your, if I think I understand your qu question correctly, absolutely, students start with a general education curriculum and then what accommodations can be made for him or her to access that and also accessing that instruction from um, our general education teachers as well as our special education teachers and then as you become more restrictive it becomes more individ individualized but always your you, where you start with is the general education curriculum and then really when you look at the numbers of students that we have identified approximately one percent or less take the alternate assessment for from right now it's park and then approximately 1% of our students who are identified, not 1% of our total um, Elmhurst population, but of those um, 13 approximate percent that are identified, only 1% of those are taking the alternative um, state assessment. And those are the students more likely to need a, a parallel or an alternative curriculum completely. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that we, we say our very first premise is, is that all of our students are getting the same curriculum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, second is around the 504, you called it changes. Um, right now we, we do the 504 manually and we're trying to systematize it. Is that... Yeah, what the and, objective and here as is? 504s have grown, and like many districts, they started out in... There's... What's unique to 504 versus um, an IEP is every state has rules and regulations related to what an IEP should look like. There are no state rules and regulations for 504 because it falls under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So each district is left to its own choice, so to speak, of what that 504 um, process and form looks like. So like many districts, um, we mirror much of what we do in special education for the processes, but the paperwork is a little bit differently, so you have to customize it to your district. So then when you go, like a lot of districts started by using standalone Word documents that they would pass on. Well, as we've grown, that has not been the best way um, to manage the numbers of uh, 504 plans, but making sure that we can get it in the hands of teachers, which they need because they are very good at making sure that students have the accommodations they need for that. And then when you talk about students moving from one building to the next, one level to the next. So this year we took on um, moving it to an online system. 
um, and I have to express appreciation for all of those individuals, the principals, the guidance counselors, assistant principals, as well as the related services staff that are involved in um, 504 evaluation and development. So it sounds as though it, all, it helps us service our students more effectively, but also our staff so that they're more informed uh, as soon Correct. as possible with what the accommodations are that the students need and therefore they can plan accordingly, And more efficiently, less time on paperwork and more time with our students, which is yielding to us. And then um, another question that I had, um, this is, uh, the, the last of two questions. One is around gr trying to get a sense of how this works for our, our students and the parents. So um, kind of start to finish and how to get feedback and how um, we communicate with the parents, that sort of thing is really kind of what I would, um, I'm sorry I didn't plan ahead to ask you this. I just happened to think about, um, I'm not sure that we ever talk about it and I think it's important, um, you know, from we bring it, we, um, we talk to the parents with the student with what the needs are, whether it be a 504 IEP, mm -hmm. make accommodations, we um, work with the parents or inform them. Um, throughout the year we meet with them, at the end of the year, transitioning from one school year to the next. Can you just kind of give a sense besides that layman's term that I provided? Sure, um, well from, I think I'll start with a student who is, uh, maybe being newly identified. Uh, that is not the first communication that any parents would be receiving is saying, hey, we wanna look at possibly doing a case study evaluation. Um, when we talk about our RTM model and our student services team, whether that be at a preschool screening or all the way through our York student services team, parents are being involved in that loop of this, because oftentimes parents are seeing it at home too. And if they're not, then it's our job, like we would say about any parent communication, that we're having that strong communication between home and school about what we're seeing, what parents are seeing, and what supports and things we're putting in place. Um, we don't automatically go to a case study evaluation for special education. It's, it, it's imperative that we try other things. Um, and then as a student is going through an evaluation process, parents are involved in that through a legal consent. But I would call what is most important to us is an informed consent. Like these are the evaluations we wanna do. This is why we wanna do them. This is the individuals who will be conducting these. And then we come back together. We review all of that in detail. If a parent does have outside providers um, and brings us information or ask us to contact, or sometimes we're asking if we can contact their outside providers, that becomes a part of that process. From there, if a student is found eligible for service services and parents have consented to that, we develop an individual education plan. And once a student has that minimally, the team is meeting annually, often more, uh, that may that may take place more often. Parents can request an IEP meeting. Um, as soon as a student is assigned a case manager or a special education teacher, um, and they're minimally communicating quarterly with update on the goal progress, but oftentimes that becomes a much more frequent communication. It doesn't mean that the parent doesn't continue to have communication with the general education teacher. It's not intended to take the place of that, but it often becomes um, the special education teacher is the one most frequently communicating with parents and I would maybe ask like Jill or Brandon to come up to say to share about how that looks in high school with students being involved in that process um, sure. Center too. sure um, okay um, the the process at the high school it's a big place a lot of teachers spread out over a, a, a wide range of the building um, but I will tell you that I think most times parents, if I'm understanding your question, want to get to what their concern is. Um, and so we like to focus that so they'll bring the right players to the table. Not the entire team is always necessary to answer a question. And sometimes we can be much more responsive and we can act more quickly by actually just having the parent communicate with the particular um, service provider or teacher uh, that would be able to best address their concerns. And then we can um, send that information out to all the team members that would be affected and would need to know that piece of information. Mm 
Okay, I got one more. <laughs> okay. Okay, professional development. Mm -hmm. So you talked about professional development for the special education mm -hmm. people, and you talked about sometimes it was given as an option at uh, Institute Day. Have you or do you plan to require or have it be the topic of a professional development for all teachers to go through some kind of professional development in dealing with the kids in their classroom that have special needs? Because as you look at those percentage, there's a high, those kids are in a lot of classrooms and we want the teachers to feel empowered, not afraid. Mm -hmm. So how do you plan to or have you addressed that? Yes, I think one of the things that Dr. Henderson Baum and I and the curriculum coordinators and directors have talked about is as one of the things, like just even some structural things, when we go back to the CDD process, the curriculum development teams, those teams have had special educators on those teams from the beginning. And it's been important for our special education teachers when they're working in their p professional learning communities, they're a part of that too, and, and talking about what that looks like for them. But I think to, if I understand the question more specifically is, do we have plans for all of our general education teachers to be exposed to things related specifically to working with students in, the, in their classrooms? And I, I would say yes, that that's an intent that we have and that's one of the things that we're looking at um, for our March Institu Institute is um, something that's focusing more on growth mindset and what that means in the classroom. I know some of our principals have already started doing some work um, in, in their individuals built in individual buildings on that. Um, if we talk about um, uh, next year, we're looking at using some of the Fontes and Pinal materials and how that can benchmark individual students for reading, not only with our resource teachers, but then how that can be used when the students are working in gen ed and what that means for leveling reading as an example. So I think our, our, I would say yes, that our commitment is there. Um, I will tell you one of the things that we all struggle with, including the curriculum department, is that when there's never enough, we wish there was way more time, and so how do we prioritize that? And I don't mean prioritizing students, but like if, if we were to look at the reading, like this year we needed to prioritize that all teachers need to, to look at how we structure a reading block, and then I feel like next year we can go deeper into then how you differentiate within that reading block when you have students with different reading levels, for whatever reason, whether they have an IEP or whether they might just have a, a reading difficulty that the receiving reading services for. I do have the one last question, and it's around your last um, slide, and it's the acceleration period. If I recall correctly, uh, you reference fifth grade and middle school for the acceleration period, or do I miss it's K, it's K-8. It is K-8, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so is that structured? Is that something new? Is it for some of our some of our buildings have already been I don't want to say experimenting with it, but they've already been able to have some time in their day where an entire grade level is has an acceleration time. Um, and actually, I'm going to maybe ask Bridget to talk about that because it's one of the buildings that she's working in that's really dug into it deep this year and how it looks there. Sure, so at Jefferson, for the last two years, we've had, we call it something different, but had the acceleration time. So each grade level has a dedicated 30 minutes each day where the students can flexible group across the um, general education grade level teachers, the reading interventionists, as well as the special education teachers. Um, so for example, one of my resource teachers runs a Words Their Way group with students who are identified as having IEPs, as well as students who might need some extra support in that area within the general education classroom, and then the general education teachers kind of at the other side running a targeted group in writing strategies, for example. Um, and so within that 30 minutes, some of our students who are more impacted and maybe have more related services are receiving some of their related services during those times so that they're not getting pulled out of, um, I think in the past we did a lot of pulling out of science and social studies to meet some of those minutes because we wanted to really protect that reading and math time for our students. Um, so that allows those students to now be participating in those core classes more 
and receiving those services during another time. Um, there's other students as well who are in the problem solving process who are receiving their interventions during that time as opposed to leaving the classroom um, at a designated time during the day to receive those supports. So it's been really positive for the staff at Jefferson. I'm really excited to see it come to the other elementary schools. Thank you, everyone. Thank oh. you. Thanks. We're done. Yeah. Chris Welton. All right, I'm not Chris, but <laughs> I'll start the process. Thank you for giving us a few minutes to, to introduce uh, the proposals for architect and construction manager. Uh, I think what I'll do is just, without rehashing the rationale, just briefly introduce the architect and then take questions on that one, then move to construction manager second. So uh, the proposal for architects that we had recommended was continuing the services that we've been getting from White and Company for architecture. Uh, White has performed at a high level for the district for a number of years. We feel that hiring a firm with that level of excellence in their past in Elmhurst promotes continuity, efficiency, and quality in any building projects, remodeling, or, or, or uh, repair work that we might undertake. Um, White's 20-year relationship with the district has included uh, the York and Hawthorne projects, which are widely recognized for uh, excellence in design and function. Um, White has, along with their, criteria, their qualifications, submitted uh, a comprehensive fee structure in their proposal. Uh, included in that is the ability to uh, possibly credit 25 to 50 percent of any design phase costs to future projects uh, which kind of results in the savings and an efficiency of working with the same comp firm for planning and development as you do during final design and furthermore comparing the fee structure that they've proposed to the standards from a survey of districts with projects uh, in the area shows that they're their fee structure is in line with other projects uh, that have happened recently at school districts in du DuPage County area. So that would be a, a short summary of why we're recommending that continuation and uh, probably stop and take questions on the architectural proposal before introducing the, the construction management proposal. Um, one of the things that we said last meeting, or I said, was the idea that we had to demonstrate to the community that should these two firms be selective without the benefit of a competitive process, that we establish not only the, the quality of their work, but the, uh, the, that they're competitive priced and that's been provided um, but it's provided in the administrative uh, section and hasn't been is there a reason why we wouldn't put that out there if we're trying to make the case to the public that uh, this is a good deal I think a, a couple reasons. One, we often present information to the administration to get some feedback from the administration before some, some things become public. Uh, secondly, because we haven't finished negotiations with White and Company on that proposal. Uh, it, it's not firm. I think on a certain level there was a desire on their part that the, the numbers weren't shared 
because if there was to be a process or a decision to go out for, for proposals or something, that's kind of their information would already be, be on the street. So, I, I guess what I'm talking about is the survey information where you went oh. out with uh, surveys and determine fees. Well, we didn't get permission from all the school districts. The surveys were done, but we didn't get permission to make them all public and what the, all of their agreements were. But those are all public school districts and those can all be FOIA'd. It's public information. Yes, they can. You just assembled what, you know, is public domain information. Um, uh, I mean, it's one thing for us to look at it and say, yes, take our word for it, these are good deals. Um, but I think if we're going to go down this way, I think we need to publish this to just demonstrate to the public that this is the way we're going to go. And it can be in a, a summary form. Um, perhaps the best thing to do is when you're completed the negotiation to present at that time, but I think we have to demonstrate that we're, you know, getting value. Um, for this we we would make this public um, if the board uh, sanctions us to go forward we would make this public um, the, the one of the points that came up is that if the board um, chooses to go in a different direction that um, we wanted all people to have the same fair competitive advantage and and so we we honored the request to uh, uh, keep this private at this point, um, but but the, the intent was never um, to to keep it uh, from the public. We would make it public one, once we know that the board um, is in agreement that this is this is the direction it wants to go. This isn't a, a vote. You're just looking for some consensus among board members. Is that is that right? The board would have to vote down the road on the ultimate contracts that are negotiated. This okay. is this is just the general parameter of um, uh, the proposal, and um, so at this point, um, I, I think we would need to know that we would need to go forward. We could take a vote at the next meeting that that we want to secure these services, but we would still be in the process of negotiating a final contract. Is that accurate, Chris? Yes. Should I move on to construction management? Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, as is the case with our relationship with the architect, White & Company, we would be recommending continuing our ongoing relationship with McHugh Construction. Like White, McHugh has performed at a very high level with the district for the last 20 years. Uh, they have been the construction manager of record on all of our projects from York High School to the present. Uh, all those projects have been completed on time and under budget. They have been taking place with scope planning and estimating for each of those jobs. And I have found uh, their their services and scope planning and their estimating to be uncannily accurate and reliable. Uh, the proposed lead on this project uh, would be a person who has been on every project in Elmhurst 205 since the York project. So he has uh, a depth of experience in school projects and in Elmhurst projects. And their fee structure we feel is competitive and transparent. And once again, I would take questions on construction management or anything related to it.
I guess I'm trying to separate our, the initial services versus long term. I mean, is it separate or is it, is well, it together? For for both of them, uh, for both of them, the proposal includes includes each. Uh, any agreement that the district would reach would be for services that we actually partake with that with that firm. So you're, you're not signing a five or 10 year agreement to work with anyone based on work that comes up. You always have the right to, to change course and switch firms you're working with in the future for, for whatever reason. As far as what does pre, can pre, what's the planning stage look like to compare it to an actual design and construction phase? Uh, within the architectural plan, there's some costs associated with that because of the amount of drawings and schematics and design work that need to be done during a planning and presentation stage and the hours that those consume, what the architects have done uh, is offered to refund somewhere between 20 and 50% of that depending on the size of the project as a credit in future construction. So uh, if we go for future projects, whatever the percentage of that is based off of their fee structure, we would credit off you know, some portion of the the work that had been done on the, on the before in the planning stage. Uh, in the case of construction management, the offer from uh, McHugh Construction has been to do the estimating, plan, uh, planning assistance, and attend meetings as needed during the planning phase of the project at no cost. So we would be working with McHugh uh, with no cost before the construction. Uh, that would be with their hopes that they would continue to be the construction manager of record going forward after that. I have a question um, more along the lines of scope of work. Are we looking at, I know you, Frank, have shared 10-year uh, projections for all of our facilities. Um, um, are we also going to have the architect and the construction worker look at all of our buildings, or are we just saying specific buildings? Uh, yes to everything. Uh, we, we, there's, we have an existing list of tenure needs. We, we have some other needs that are arising can be identified that probably aren't within that basket. We have needs on educational delivery and how we would like things to look that are separate from our actual capital maintenance needs. And of course we have the desires uh, for what things should, how things should function and how we should deliver curriculum and in what setting uh, that has been identified through the Focus 205 process. So I think all those things come into a long-term facility plan and that, that long-term facility plan is what informs any future projects uh, coming from this. So not knowing exactly what that process is going to tell us at the very end and also not knowing what the community does and does not want to fund or support, it's very difficult at this time to identify a size or scope of a project. Um, so what that does is makes it difficult. So what you see in the, the proposal from White & Company is a range of fee percentages based off the size and type of potential projects size of project and also whether a project is new construction, remodeling, or capital work. And uh, in, with construction management, the, the fee tends to be more stable, or at least the way that McHugh likes to work fees and, and general conditions. But then general conditions, which can include on-site management and other things that happen in a construction site, is going to vary widely and can't be predicted without knowing what type of job it is. Any other questions from the board? Okay. I don't know how you're breaking it up exactly because I was out for a few minutes. Uh, well, we, it's one item on the agenda. Uh, I introduced and took questions about the architect first and introduced the construction management and took questions on that second. Uh, I, I believe the superintendent's intention is 
looking for guidance on whether to move forward with this process as uh, having to bring back contracts for approval later or whether the board, the board has a different direction they want to go. So, Yes, uh, you know, what, what we need to know is can we move forward with our existing relationships and then begin the process of uh, negotiating final contracts um, or is the board going to uh, want to see a formal uh, RFQ process and uh, then we would have to get that out to bid almost immediately due to the length of time that that would take um, and and the amount of work that needs to be done in order to have uh, decent community input in the fall. Uh, I just, yeah, one thing that I think should point out too, especially if you, if you, when you say re request for qualification, if we do an RFQ and choose a most qualified candidate, at the end of that process, we still end up back at the same moment where we have to negotiate with someone for the exact fee structure and scope of services based off the projects as they, they, they may happen. So uh, it doesn't necessarily change that, that, that moment that we're at right now. <coughs> Can I ask, um, you say you would do RFQ and not RFP. RFQ, it's restricted to the qualifications of there. There's no financial component to it. You're still doing an individual negotiation and using the, the market resources to determine what's a good price for that negotiation. Um, the fact of the matter is I don't know that anyone would question the qualifications of either of these firms in their field. They do enormous amount of work in um, the fact that we've got a good track record with them, um, you know, is, is, is as good as any. Um, this is... Uh, let me ask this: Did the did you in your survey inquire whether those other districts um, utilized an RFQ, or did they? Uh, I mean, do you have any idea whether they've taken a similar approach of long-standing relationship with the these entities, their entities that they use? When's the last time they changed them? How did they do it? Did they do it by RFQ? Um, can you talk about that? There, the selection process and, and what your research might have shown with that? I didn't, um, I don't believe that information was in the surveys. Um, I think with architects you generally do RFQ. I think construction manager, I have seen RFPs as well, which does include the price component. The, the difficult thing with doing an RFP related to construction manager is the, um, the general conditions, which has to do with the hourly rate and the amount of time on site the, uh, the construction management company puts in, um, especially with, with the length of time you know, we, which are like unknown variables. What is the project? How long will it be? You know, that general conditions part would be really tough to do an RFP for since we don't know what the project is. I know there's some, uh, the problem with, I mean, you want your architect, you want that continuity and but it's a different reason why you want continuity with your construction manager because what you're looking for there is um, you know continuity with those estimates as opposed to you know having one for one phase and then a new one comes in and says well I don't I didn't do those numbers I'm not responsible for them um, so that's the argument for continuity but is it possible to retain a construction manager for this first pre uh, this conceptual phase um, and uh, 
take advantage of of their experience in that to to help develop the concept that we would introduce to the or the concepts we would introduce to the community in the fall and then reserve the larger decision about the construction phase um, to a later date yeah it's it's certainly possible there's 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 definitely two or three ways to to uh, to attack this problem uh, my feeling is that there's whether which ever path the board decides to take whether that's to retain the services of our, of our our known service provider and negotiate the best possible contract with them now or to do an RFQ RFP process uh, my recommendation would be to do it sooner not later if we were to do an RFQ RFP for construction manager I, I would still I would recommend doing it sooner to bring that person on sooner uh, I, I think ha having a firm having a firm work through all the concept and scope identification and then not be the firm that delivers the the project afterwards leads to the firm that does end up having to deliver that project being having to eat, live with the previous firm's numbers which could lead to them either either the previous firm's numbers not being good and the other firm you know saying that that's the reason that we're coming in over original budgets and estimates or the original numbers were good but the second firm isn't as good as delivering as the previous firm would have been and still having those same kind of disagreements and, and, and disconnect there's also there's also the timing of value engineering okay so within within any design there's going to be kind of a very first rough thought of what the design should be in a real rough cost us and what what that's going to cost and then you, you start to board down into it a little bit not not to construction documents yet but into more fully realized conceptual documents and you start to put a slightly more accurate budget on that and if you do that pre-funding pre-budgeting and funding of a project it allows you allows you to make your value engineering decisions what things should we leave out to save money with the construction manager of record making those recommendations and pricing with the architect of record going forward before the drawings are used for for publicity and or funding or budgeting reasons if you if you don't do that value engineering part as vigorously before that piece you end up with things on drawings and documents and and pieces of information that are used in the in the budgeting and funding phase which may end up not actually being delivered at the end phase so there ends up being an implied promise of things in the design or in the project that because you didn't do your value engineering early and vigorously end up not happening after the project so for those two reasons my personal recommendation would be to either continue our relationship with the existing construction manager or quickly move now to do a process to to choose a construction manager so that we can do that as early as possible and bring the construction manager on throughout the remainder of the planning phase. Uh, I, I think you, using a, a firm that you're not going to go forward on the second half leads to that disconnect and, and, and the less vigorous value engineering. And if we're going to, if, if we're just in the back of our head plan, use that firm anyways, then the RFQ, RFP process really isn't as open and as a, in, to, all comers as it should be. So that's kind of my feeling on. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with what John, what, with what you're saying. For the information gathering process, we, we want to take advantage of the relationships that we have. Um, we don't even have concepts, so it's hard to think about the next phase when there's really nothing to look at or we haven't asked the community about anything so i think for information gathering to get concepts we we go with the people that we have relationships with um how do you ask uh, other firms anyway if you didn't have a something to show them i mean it's it's difficult because we don't have the concepts so I guess we're just evaluate, you'd evaluate another firm on their, their, what they've done in the past. Well, uh, we, yeah. we can't get the concepts till we 
enter into a relationship with the people. Right, so I'm agreeing right. with that. The, the yeah. further we go in the process without a construction manager on the board, so we, we've already started general bundling of options, vaguely what might be options that we might talk about, and, you start, and the board has started to ask us to try to put numbers to that. The further we go in that process without a construction manager on board, and preferably a construction manager that will be responsible for delivering those numbers on the back end, the more, the further along in that narrowing of the budget we get without construction manager input. And, and so what, what I've seen in the past and what I've learned from talking to my colleagues who've gone through this uh, is that the further in the design process you get with budget estimates with only, with only one source of check being the, the designers themselves and not having that construction management input, the more likely it is that that number is not as sharp as it would be as a construction manager ran it through their process early on. Uh, so what I've seen in projects in the past is when, that, when you have a lot of design and a lot of the schematics and a lot of the pre-budget pre determination without the service or of the construction manager of record, uh, there ends up being a lot of things value engineered out of the project afterwards. When the construction manager takes place from the beginning, usually, pretty much usually what you get on the back end delivered in the buildings and in the additions and in the work is what was budgeted and proposed during the budgeting and funding process, so. The same thing, I think for pre-construction services, I'm looking at these proposals, you would go forward with the people we have relationships with, for the pre-construction services. That's my recommendation. I don't know if the other board members want to weigh in. Well, I, I'm not a board member, but I want to make sure, I want to make sure that there's no confusion here. The administration believes that we need to secure the services of an architect and a construction manager. And the sooner we do that, the better. So what we're trying to do is get approval to either move forward with the people that we have or to put out an RFQ to secure those services to um, ob obtain the people that we want to work with. I think Frank had indicated that changing horses midstream is probably not advisable. So if, if we, if we want to follow a certain process now to secure the people, the options really are go with the existing relationships or do, do an RFQ um, or go with the existing relationship with one and do an RFQ for the other. But I don't think we want to do preliminary stuff now with the risk of changing people after we get that initial process started. Be way in here. Um, I agree with what Dr. Moir and uh, Frank have said. I mean, it makes no sense to hire someone for pre-construction services and then put it out to RFQ, RFP, and proceed with another construction manager, manager and architectural firm. Um, construction managers and architects save you money by being accurate the first time around. And you can't expect someone to live with somebody else's numbers and design and preliminary design so we got to pick our firm now now in that light white and McHugh, as frank has said has served the district well for over two decades i believe they are eminently qualified um, but i also understand that there are people in our community who work for other qualified firms um, and I haven't heard from, from any of them lately, but uh, you know you, you have to you have to um, consider what others in our community would would think. And I, I don't know how many board members have been contacted, how many have not, uh, if any. Um, and I also understand that the um, prospect of competition can 
induce a price that is as good as or better as actual uh, competition. So with that said, mm -hmm. I can support either way. Um, and I think either way we'll end up with a good product uh, and a good concept. But uh, it's just a matter of how much time the board wants to spend to get to that final decision. Other board members? William? Um, I guess I would just say if the alternative is an RFQ, we've seen the qualifications of these firms through their experience with the district and the other work that they've done. Um, my concern is with price. If it's going to be a negotiated price and you're going to come back with uh, negotiating price, I think we needed to definitely demonstrate to the community uh, that those prices are good by showing the analysis that that demonstrates that the negotiation process produced a good price in each of those instances. But let's also remember here that what we're negotiating is professional services. We're not negotiating a price for a multi-million construction project. Right. Um, so in that case, the qualifications, experience, uh, and relationship um, are as important uh, because I think you're going to find that the dispersion of prices are incredibly small. And uh, expertise and knowledge and, and familiarity can well override uh, multiple times over the, uh, the difference in price for, for these kind of management and consulting services. No, not perfectly. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so, I, <clears throat> I guess we need to know if the consensus is that we be, begin a negotiations process with the existing people, um, which seems to be what I what I heard, but I can't say that I'm a hundred percent sure that that's what I heard. <laughs> With that what tell me how you would feel with this suggestion that we proceed mm -hmm. to uh, negotiate with the people that we have a relationship with should the administration be unhappy with the uh, results of those negotiations that we keep the door open to going out to RFQ Yeah, I think I think that's possible. Um, you know, if if I think that that would be uh, a possibility, uh, even if we, we went the other direction, is that if we weren't satisfied with with what was going on, we wouldn't want to continue that relationship. So, Mary's not here for late arrivals. So do we want to? I'll, I'll just cover that quickly in, in your packet. She wrote um, a proposal that we would like to bring to you on May 23rd uh, for approval, and that is to add three late arrivals at the K-8 level. Um, currently, the high school has late arrival um, weekly in most cases, and the elementary and, and the middle schools have had uh, some difficulty um, being able to do the work that we're asking them to do um, due to the fact that they don't have uh, as many. And last year we compromised a lot of their time with all the assessment work that needed to be done. Um, this year we returned a lot of that time to the buildings 
um, for their school improvement work and um, have been struggling to figure out how to get the assessment work done that we need to do and we're not making um, as quick a progress in that area as I think we need to be. So she described a lot of the work that, that we, uh, a lot of things we use that time for. The purpose of adding those three is that they would be solely dedicated to assessment work um, so that the other work that we need to do in the buildings could continue without compromising that. And we wanted to bring that to you uh, for approval on May 23rd. So we wanted to introduce it to you tonight so that you'd have a chance to think about that. Any comments or we'll, we'll wait for discussion for next board meeting? Okay. Okay, let's move on to superintendent's agenda. Algebra. Okay, um, I indicated to you that uh, the reason this is coming separate is that it came through a lot of the mass CDT work and um, it took Yeoman's effort by Dave Beatty and a little bit of extra time to come to agreement on this item. Um, but for the first time uh, in a long time in this district, uh, we will have all of our students taking algebra using the same resource. And we think that's a very important step we're very happy that we were able to come to that consensus. So we're asking for approval to display these materials for 30 days. Um, it's no different than we have with any of the other materials. It's just that we've, um, we're not able to get them done under these circumstances sooner like we would have liked. Coming up or do we? Dave is here in the event that after you make the motion, if there is discussion and questions, that he, he will be able to answer them. Okay. I need a motion. I just have a question. What is the proposed Algebra 1 math curriculum resource? There we go. <laughs> well, let's, make a, let's make a motion. Well, okay. It, it, you know, whatever. You got the letter CME that appear in the second paragraph. Is that the product? Or is the product called Math Curriculum Resources? Or is is it a class of product? What are we approving? Or what are we approving displaying, rather? Yeah, it's this text resource right here. So it's available in print and in digital with some online additional things as well. So CME is the publisher. Uh, Pearson's this the publisher. CME is the group that helped create it. Okay. And this, is, this is a little unspecific, but I'd make a motion that the Board of Education approve the public display of the proposed Algebra 1 math curriculum resource being the green book that Jim's holding right now. <laughs> Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, moved by John, second by Jim. Any discussion? Okay. Yeah, so can you in a minute or less kind of walk through the process of sure. how you chose this, how it ties into the rest of our curriculum? Sure. Um, so I've actually, we had a number of teachers from our middle school and high school who teach algebra. And those teachers have been meeting over the, I mean, we've had teachers meeting since August um, to some degree on this topic. And through the course of all the discussions we've had, we've evaluated multiple resources. We've looked at resources we currently use, other resources on the market right now. Um, and we've finally gotten to consensus around this particular resource, how, um, coherent the resources from top to bottom, how um, we can use it in multiple layers in our system. We've got students in eighth grade taking algebra, students in ninth grade taking algebra, um, and we wanna make sure that, that the resource we have can be consistent so that no matter where you encounter algebra in your career in Elmhurst, you're getting the core ideas of algebra are going to be very similar because the teachers are using the same resource. Whereas right now we've got four, I think, separate resources from four different publishers, 
um, chosen at different times by different groups of teachers based on curriculum cycles and other sorts of things. What we want to do is make sure that it all stitches together. So, you know, as we move forward, we're going to have our eighth grade math is going to look similar no matter which, I mean, it's kind of a misnomer, but eighth grade math is the math you would take as an eighth grader typically on grade level, right? So you might encounter that in seventh grade. You might encounter that in sixth grade, depending on the student. But that eighth grade math course, which sometimes we call pre-algebra, we want that to be similar across the board. So the students then are entering algebra, which is going to be similar across the board. Now there will be differences based on when the student encounters the algebra, what they've done before. Um, but those disparate di differences are going to be layered on top of what the core of algebra is that our, our math department across schools has come to um, consensus upon. So we're going to be creating uh, shared assessments layered from uh, that resource. And then we'll be consistently updating and thinking about that curriculum over time as um, we move forward, but we want to make sure that it's consistent across schools. It shouldn't matter whether you're taking a algebra in the middle school or algebra in the high school. You take algebra in Elmhurst, you're getting Elmhurst algebra. You're right. It wasn't not, it, not many years ago, everyone took algebra freshman year in high school. Mm -hmm. And now this is a subject that, that bridges, depending upon where you are in your math education, between middle school and high school. Um, what assurances or, or what, it's not the right word, what um, process did you follow to make sure that this ties into what kids will, will be exposed to in, high, in the, the remainder of their high school mm -hmm. uh, math curriculum? Right, so um, it, the resource which was approval for display either the last board meeting or two board meetings ago, there's an Algebra 2 resource, which is the same CME um, group that created it. Pearson publishes it. So it's internally it's aligned because the same group created both. So we have definite alignment there. Um, and then our geometry group is still, we're still in a phase of looking at what resource, but it's likely, it's looking like, we'll be using the CME geometry materials as well. So we'll have alignment throughout that sequence is what we're hoping to see. And they, they have a pre-calculus book as well, which we'll see how that goes moving into the fourth year. But I, you know, ultimately it's not necessarily the resource that, it, it shouldn't be the resource that determines what, our, what we have. And in fact, even with this, we're gonna have to supplement, we're gonna have to do, you know, it, it's gonna be more than just that textbook. Um, but I do think that we're seeing um, that there's definitely alignment with those groups. And those, those, te those teacher teams are also have been meeting amongst each other, with each other, as they've been deciding on the different um, text resources. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need a voice vote to approve the display of this book or the curriculum materials. So all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, it's approved for display. Action on closed session item. We have two motions. Can I start? Um, I move that the Board of Education approve Heidi Thomas as principal of Field Elementary School with a start date of August 1st, 2017 and a base salary of $111,274. Second. Second. Okay, moved by Jim, second by Kara. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Heidi, welcome. I think uh, I, from just meeting you for a short period of time and uh, out, you know, yeah, a few hours ago, <laughs> and, um, and knowing that you've been thoroughly vetted by the administration, by teachers at Field, by our parent community, um, all I can say is welcome, and uh, we're lucky to have you. Thanks. Roll call vote. Go ahead. Mr. Collins? Yes. Mrs. Caforio? Yes. Mr. McDonough? Yes. Mrs. Stufen? Yes. Mrs. Ebner? Yes. It's five eyes, no nays, two absent. The motion passes.
Go ahead. I move that the Board of Education approve Timothy Reardon as principal of Hawthorne Elementary School with a start date of August 1st, 2017 and a base salary of $111,274. Second. I'll second. <laughs> Moved by Karen, second by John. Karen, go ahead. Yes. Um, so this is, we are very honored to be announcing that um, Tim has been here a year at both Hawthorne and Lincoln as an assistant principal. And what, we're, uh, what we have been talking about for a number of years now is to promote from within and have a career path for our employees. And so we're very um, glad that Tim uh, wants to step up and lead Hawthorne um, with all the things that he has started even this year with the LA and, and math, the Eureka Math uh, whiz, uh, already helping the teachers. So welcome aboard, congratulations. Mrs. Stufan. Yes. Mr. McDonough. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Mrs. Coforio. Yes. Mrs. Ebner. Yes, it's five ayes, no nays, two apps, and the motion passes. Superintendent's communication. Good morning. <laughs> um, I was asked uh, to provide for you um, some preliminary numbers on um, work that could be done in a major facilities project as they relate to the scenarios that Elizabeth Hennessy presented um, at the uh, uh, last board meeting. And I, I need to emphasize that these really are very rough estimates. Um, we need some schematic designs to, to begin to get more accurate, uh, a more accurate picture of what things would actually cost. Um, but as a starting point, this, this gives people some idea of what might be possible. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so um, uh, it's a starting point of a conversation. And um, the idea being that um, the $100 million scenario that you saw, the $128 million scenario, and the $151 million scenario, that the community would ultimately decide what it's willing to support, what it values, what its priorities are. And so um, that would come through a, a much more formal in, uh, input process next year, uh, or next fall. So we started uh, with some of the things that, that we know um, are very practical needs like Lincoln and Field, um, and then began to take into account some of the other things that were coming through the Focus 205 process, as well as um, various different things with um, uh, backdated or current um, technology upgrades and um, routine maintenance types of things that need to be addressed. And so they're all included in here. Um, as we all know, um, the city is not releasing um, uh, money uh, promised us in the IGA related to TIF-1. Uh, we've had to go into fund balance to the tune of approximately $3 million to cover last summer and next summer's um, uh, capital projects and and um, so some of these things that are included in here uh, could be taken out um, if the city makes good on its commitment which would either lower the cost of projects or allow us to do other enhancements provide us more flexibility um, we provided three scenarios anything in these scenarios um, if the community decides it values something um, uh, it, you know, there, there would be flexibility to decide we would pay for something at the expense of something else. This was just created as a starting point for the conversation. Um, so uh, I will go through this in a little bit of detail here. Um, so in the first scenario, the $100 million scenario, because of the way the bonds are staggered, the um, 
cost per year uh, per the taxpayer varies more. But um, uh, these are all based on the median price of a home at $387,300. And they're all exactly verbatim taken from Elizabeth Hennessy's presentation last time. Um, $154 a year in the first year, $132 a year in the second year, and then um, in years three through 17, $18 a year, and then um, uh, with refinancing, this option includes refinancing, it would take us through to 2036, and so the remaining years on that would be $104 a year. To give you an idea what that means, uh, the, 20, the 2006 referendum was a $41 million referendum, and that cost the average taxpayer then on a $350,000 home, uh, $350 a year. Um, I may have said a month, that, that, that's wrong. If I said a month, it's wrong. All these numbers are for a, a year, a year, okay? So I apologize. In the second scenario, which is 128 million, um, because of the way we would structure the bonds and the length of the um, extension of the bonds, that would actually be able to be done for only $7 a year uh, on, on the median home. And then in the third scenario for $151 million, um, the cost uh, to the taxpayer would be $100 a year. And so um, there are, are varying options for the total cost, varying options for how we would bond it out. That would then indicate how we would schedule the construction work um, and all of this would be predicated on, you know, what the community values and what it would be willing to support, which goes back to what Chris was saying earlier about the, the difficulty in being able to get extremely precise numbers at this point has to do with the fact that um, there are still a lot of unknowns. Um, so in the first scenario, I'm, I'm going to go scenario to scenario. So Dave, if you could scroll down um, as I go. The, the first includes Lincoln School um, with an estimated price of uh, 27 to $31 million possibly, or if we decided to go with a little bit smaller square footage that was a little more appropriate for the size of that lot. Um, and that could only be done if we added capacity at Edison, which is included here. Um, you could save some money uh, and that would be uh, a little bit less total cost. Now, these ranges, again, I want to caution everybody when they see numbers, people lock on the numbers. These are all very, very, very preliminary. Um, and then if you would scroll down, we talk about renovating field. Uh, that would be about 14 to 18 million. Edison, uh, about seven to 10 million. And I just wanted to kind of reiterate why that's included here. It is a centrally located site that does have the ability to expand. Many of our schools are landlocked. If we experience future enrollment growth, we have some flexibility. If we go to all day kindergarten, uh, pending the outcome of a, a study this fall, we would then have additional space to either um, uh, redistrict and or go to an all day kindergarten center, depending on what the community uh, would like to see. Um, and then also, there's a big advantage to being able to do the construction when the building's vacant. You don't interrupt instruction, you can get the design you want, and you can do it in a more timely manner. So it would give us a lot of flexibility to relocate students during the construction of Lincoln. Then on there is York Auditorium. This was left off the 2000 referendum due to cost. Um, significant needs uh, at the York Auditorium that we literally do not know how we would possibly begin to pay for just out of existing operating funds when we're having trouble trying to figure out how to pay for what we need to do uh, as it is. Uh, so with the interest in fine arts here and the fact that everybody goes to the high school and the fact that it was included in the 2000 project, we thought it was appropriate to include here. Uh, we need some upgrades to our tech infrastructure, and then we wanted to move in a direction of STEM spaces, future ready learning spaces, 
in media centers and other areas of our existing elementary buildings. We did not get into a lot of thorough study of middle schools because Lincoln and Field were driving this and we didn't really know at the outset what our bonding capacity was going to be or what the community was going to want to do. And so there, there are possibilities at the middle school, but um, uh, at the middle schools, but there were also some concerns about um, wanting to, to do it in a comprehensive manner and, and be very deliberate about um, what we want our middle schools to look like. So some of that could be part of the process depending on the community feedback, but you will see some reference to some middle school projects in here. One of them is included here, which are safe and secure entrances at Bryan and Sandburg. Uh, people will want to see that uh, based on what we heard. And air conditioning at Jackson and Jefferson, which um, uh, was left off of our summer work because we, we didn't think we wanted to um, commit to that, not knowing our funding. In the second scenario, um, we basically included everything in the first scenario and then just extended it out. But again, like I said in the beginning, that doesn't mean that some of this stuff couldn't be interchangeable depending on what people decide that they want to see. So on the second scenario, we included the, the back maintenance types of expenditures that are in Frank's plan. We've been estimating that putting money in the Lincoln it'd be about $5 million for a 10-year fix, at which point we'd be right back to where we started and we'd be allocating money uh, to Lincoln that really would consume all of our expenditures and not be able to go anywhere else. Um, you also see on here central air at four elementary schools. That might possibly not be needed if we go with uh, Jackson and Jefferson and then of course decide that the uh, the project includes these other buildings that, that could kind of be taken care of. But otherwise, um, the rest of that is just work that's been scheduled um, that uh, has to do with more infrastructure and other basic types of things like that. And then uh, the possibility of the early learning center would be about five to 10 million. And that's something that came out of feedback in the last referendum as well. And then in the third scenario, we extend that out even further and we get into um, additional STEM spaces and upgrades at the middle schools, um, York, uh, athletic fields at York, um, auditorium and library at Churchville. Um, all of these things are possible in other scenarios as well, but we tried to start with what we thought was um, the most pressing in, from a practical standpoint, uh, the feedback on all day kindergarten, the feedback on STEM, the York Auditorium was our starting point just for the purposes of this discussion. And, and, and so we may see some things take some shape after we get additional rounds of input. Um, this was really just designed to be a, start, a conversation starter and show people approximately how far the money could go and what some potential options are to include. Um, so essentially, um, based on the community input, um, there's a combination of anything from zero dollars and no referendum to $151 million. And that's, you know, that's kind of what we're, we're, we're trying to show at this point. Thank you. Any questions? Just so I understand this, to you basically, it's cumulative. Your scenario one is the smallest. Scenario two includes those things in scenario one plus these things in the? Correct. Okay. All right. And when you say $7 a year, you're in addition to those additions that are in scenario one. No, I'm saying that. I'm saying that based on what Elizabeth presented, we could do a bonding scenario that would get us $128 million worth of uh, upgrades in this district with um, 
with a bond extension through 2041 that would cost the uh, taxpayer of a median home in Elmhurst uh, an additional $7 a year. It, it's because it goes out so much farther. It goes out farther and the structuring of the refinancing and all those other different things, there's just so many nuances. Chris might be able to explain them. I, yeah. I can't explain them. I just saw that and thought, wow, that looks pretty good. Yeah, I think based on the hour, let's not get into the details of that tonight. Yeah, I think with this, you'd want to go out to the community and ask, you know, when, when we have the information and we're ready, it's, it's really what you said, up to the community. Correct. What, what, and so when I showed a tentative timeline uh, to you at the last meeting, the idea was that we would, if, if we could get the drawings, um, which, which, you know, we've been talking about, is we would start that process in the fall and, and have a very formal, um, thorough process of communicating and getting input and feedback and trying to ascertain um, what the community would like to see. Okay, go ahead. And so just to clarify, scenario two and scenario three then accommodate what I referenced earlier with um, when Chris and Frank were um, presenting, it's all of our buildings. Future 10 year building. Yeah, at some numbers. point or another, um, even in scenario one, um, there's the potential, like I said, to adjust different things. But the way I laid it out here, um, most of our buildings are addressed in some capacity in scenario one, but not necessarily all. In two and three, uh, virtually, yes, in two and three, they all are. With the flexibility, again, that people may want to see something as opposed to the other or whatever. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna stay up here because walking back over there just seems like a lot of effort right now. <laughs> I only have well, one more thing. And um, the other thing on my superintendent's report, I just wanted to, Give some kudos to Ben Hartman, who's an instructional coach at Churchville. Um, he uh, attended a Google Certified Innovators Academy in London, England. He was selected, he had to apply and was accepted into this program for his community garden uh, project. And um, the, the uh, um, academy was set up around design thinking. And um, he was just um, extremely um, thrilled with his experience and has already started to bring it back to the district. And a couple of his statements that I thought were pretty interesting. Um, he said, um, when we fall in love with the solution or a certain way of doing something, we miss the opportunity to try anything else. That, that was a direct quote from one of his takeaways. Another thing that he thought was a takeaway was, um, going through this process was how culture impacts everyone. And, it, and um, he started thinking, uh, helped him process strategies to, to how do you achieve positive change more quickly. And so um, just a very much of an honor for him. And I just wanted to highlight that and recognize him. Okay, thanks. Any board communications? I'll be brief. Um, but I, I did want to say that I came back early from my business trip on uh, Saturday to um, attend the eighth grade innovation, um, which I'm sure I'll get the name of this wrong, but the eighth grade uh, innovation fair, perhaps, um, expo. Thank you, Leah. Um, and uh, each REACH ELA uh, student in the district was asked to uh, research a project or research a subject that, was, that they were passionate about. And um, it was spectacular 
to see the range of topics that, that these kids spent the entire academic year uh, researching, uh, the product that they came up with. I mean, it, it, this is exactly what we should be doing on so many levels. I mean, it, it, it allowed a kid to, ex to educate themselves on, and, and talk to experts in the field that they were researching. Um, several kids had talked to prof college professors to help them. Um, others professionals in the field and and it taught these kids to manage a long-term full academic year project while they're in eighth grade and and some of the kids uh, learned a whole lot about time management and what the price of procrastination um, so it, it, at, on just on so many different levels I, I would love to have uh, at a future board meeting those uh, those reach ELA teachers in to do a much better job than I just attempted to do of what the goals of the projects were and, and what some of the topics they covered were. Anything else? Okay. Upcoming meetings, Tuesday, May 23rd, Board of Education meeting, Tuesday, June 20th, Board of Education meeting. We're at the end of the meeting. I'll declare the meeting adjourned. <laughs>